Bem-vindos to the Type Theory for All podcast. As always, this is your host, Pedro Abreu. And I'm still here in my wonderful sabbatical in Brazil, which, by the way, I definitely recommend to anyone listening. When was the last time you took some time off? Well, anyways, today's guest probably many of you already know, or at least have heard of. Kevin Buzzard has been very passionate spreading the word among mathematicians to use to improve our strip of theorems of modern mathematics. In this conversation, we will talk about his vision of teaching undergrads to use the Lean Theorem Prover, what is the Zena project, his views of how theorem provers can change the way we do mathematics, that and much more. But before we begin, a huge shout out to Charles Sutherland, a big supporter of the show through the, our Ko-Fi platform. We really appreciate your support, dude. It's people like you that really gets this show going. If you want to be a, such a cool person like Charles, go to our website, type3forall.com, click on the Ko-Fi button in the bottom left, support me, and contribute to the show. Any amount is hugely welcome and greatly appreciated. Well, with that being said, let's get into it. All right, welcome everyone to one more episode of the Type Theory for All podcast. This is your host, Pedro Abreu, and today is my great pleasure to be here with someone that is being very, very passionate about theorem provers, but he's not really a computer science scientist. And I have with me today, Kevin Buzzard. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm definitely not a computer scientist. I'm a mathematician, right? right? And you've been, and you actually have been very, very um, passionate. I can see about theorem provers and doing your theorems in 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 a computer. How did that interest came about? So there were two independent reasons, uh, and then they all kind of came together. So the two reasons were the following: firstly, I was interested in uh, teaching. I'm very interested in teaching, and I was teaching the intro to proof class at my university imperial college london and uh, i thought it would be i thought it would be interesting to goof around a bit see if i could use some new technology and uh, show students different ways of thinking about a proof so that was the first thing uh, that motivated me to learn about uh, interactive theorem provers and the second thing was that something that I'm not so worried about now, but I went through a, some kind of a midlife crisis and got very concerned about whether the results uh, in my area were really uh, actually rigorously proved or whether sometimes maybe there were just some arguments in papers that nobody was checking carefully and might have some problems. I, I was slightly worried about whether everything was rigorous uh, ju just for a couple of years at the beginning. Uh, and I'm no longer worried Uh, because I'm now older and wiser, uh, but but it was that was another thing at that time that sort of pushed me into into wondering whether interactive theorem provers could somehow help the research aspects uh, of my job. So th that was that were the two things that independently drew me towards uh, interactive theorem provers. So what what exactly you were concerned about? Because if I understand correctly, how results in in math are are made is that, okay, someone spends some time doing some research, proving some theorems, and then he comes up with a paper and with and then with a proof, and then you submit it to some journal and the uh, reviewers are going to take a look at it and they're going to say whether they agree with that proof or not. And that that's just it. Is that what you were concerned that this was not rigorous enough or something along those lines? I, I So that system, yeah, that's the system and it works great for centuries uh and i was slightly i became slightly concerned that it was not scaling uh because because nowadays you get papers uh in mathematics which are you know, over a hundred pages long and you know these get sent to referees and the referee has a few months to look at this paper and the referee is you know is not being paid to read this 100 page paper uh and it might be very technical Uh, and I've, you know, I've seen, I've seen examples where things have not been refereed as carefully 
uh, as they could have been. And so it was, I, I just sort of worry as papers, as papers are getting bigger and maths is getting more complicated, I was just concerned that the traditional approach uh, did not scale. But I, I, I should perhaps say that it was a, uh, a conversation with the philosopher of mathematics a couple of years ago uh, in Paris. They, they said that actually mathematics always is a bit noisy around the edges. And this is the nature of the subject, that the stuff that's at the cutting edge has never quite settled down uh, and is, is never quite sort of fully understood and in the final form when you look at the original papers. You know, it's, and, and when I started looking at things from a more historical point of view, I realised that perhaps my, uh, you know, my worries were unfounded. This is, this is somehow what calmed me down about this matter. But by that stage, I'd, spent, I'd invested too much into learning how to use interactive theorem proofs <laughs> and decided I wasn't going to go back anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely makes sense because, well, anything that is kind of cutting edge is just, it's kind of, you're just trying to solve a problem. You just solve it the, the best way you can at the time and it's not going to be great. And then later on, when we have to reuse those ideas, then things are start getting polished or maybe you, you want, you're going to teach some students and then you really have to go to the essence and trying to make things as clean as possible. So, I, I think I think I get your point. That's 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 pretty fair. Um, so how did you how did you nowadays you you use Lean a lot? How did you end up using Lean? What's the story there? So it was the summer before uh, I started teaching this Introduction to Proof course, 2017, and I was just googling around uh, trying to find because I knew nothing about interactive theorem proofs at all. Uh, in 2017. But I was aware that there'd been some work, for example, there'd been this work of Gontier verifying, you know, the, the four color theorem and later on the odd order theorem. These were, you know, these were interesting mathematical theorems, which had been formally checked. And uh, Gontier was using software called Coq. And so I started using Coq. Uh, I, I tried that for a couple of weeks. And then I went to a talk by Thomas Hales, uh, at the Newton Institute in Cambridge. I, I should say I attended virtually, uh, but Hales uh, had just finished uh, his formalization of the proof uh, of the Kepler conjecture, which was also uh, you know, another major piece of formalizing news. And uh, I watched his talk, and he suggested maybe making a big library of all modern mathematics, at least the definitions in modern mathematics. He, he, he was clearly thinking out the box. He was thinking about, you know, where this area was going and, you know, the things, things that could be done that had not even at that stage even been sort of attempted. Uh, and he spoke of, you know, this, this vision he had of a, you know, a, 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 a formal definitions of many things to the extent that we could start stating the theorems of modern mathematics, not proving them, but just stating them. Uh, and somebody asked him which system he would suggest uh, that this project be carried out in. And he suggested Lean. And Lean was software that I'd never heard of uh, in my life. But, you know, again, I just, I searched up Lean and I found it and started using it. And I realized that actually it was in a really good place. It was quite coincidental. Uh, it, at the same meeting where Tom Hales gave his talk, it was decided to start a mathematics library for Lean. So a bunch of mathematics was split off uh, from the core Lean 3 library uh, into a new library called MathLib. And MathLib had just enough in it uh, for it to be a lot of fun, as far as I was concerned. For example, it had the real numbers, but it didn't have the complex numbers. Uh, and the real numbers and the complex numbers were used everywhere in my class. Uh, and it had things like functions and equivalence relations, which were, you know, talked about in my class. But there was there were other things we used, like sine and cosine, which it didn't have. Because sine and cosine are very, you know, at school, we just define it to be opposite over hypotenuse in some triangle. But, of course, that's not going to be the definition in a theorem prover because there's no pictures. So... Some of my course I could do and other parts I couldn't do. And I just thought, let's, you know, challenge myself to do as much of the course as possible and, you know, see if I could make the rest. Why not make sine and cosine? And then it all kind of 
escalated from there. Just the desire to to do basic undergraduate level mathematics in what was at that time quite a new theorem prover. So is that where Zina Project was born? What is that? The yeah, the it's 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 nothing. It's lots of things. At the time, at the time, it was an attempt to to get a brand. Like there was clearly. It, it took me a few months to realize this, but what was going on was that there were many interactive theorem provers. There are many interactive theorem provers, and they're being extensively used, some of the more popular ones, in computer science departments you know, around the world and are being used by computer scientists uh, to do highly non-trivial things. But no mathematicians uh, were using them at all, or essentially no mathematicians. Obviously, Tom Hales is an exception, but I would imagine that Gontier... Uh, would describe himself as a computer scientist. So very few mathematicians were using them. And after a couple of months of playing around with them, I, I, became, I became pretty convinced that these things had the, real, had the potential to completely change my subject area, to completely change mathematics. You know, these things could become automated helpers that was you know, doing literature searches for us, suggesting lemmas we should prove, suggesting proofs. Uh, you know, I... I'm not, I'm not one of these wild believers in kind of AGI and computers proving the Riemann hypothesis all you know by themselves and the whole thing becoming autonomous. I I think we're a very long way from that, uh, but I think a necessary intermediate step is that computers uh, get smart enough at modern mathematics that they can start helping human mathematicians. And I just thought that there was a huge uh, potential there, so. The Zena project was just, you know, it was mathematicians learning lean. I decided that I would start a blog and attempt to teach other mathematicians uh, how to use the software. And what happened after a while was it there was a clear dichotomy. There was a clear split. Like most members of staff uh, had absolutely no interest at all uh, in learning how to use the software because they were completely happy uh, with doing mathematics the way that they've always done it, or on pen and paper or using computers in more traditional ways, you know, as number crunches. Uh, and then there were the undergraduates who were really into the idea. <laughs> so the Zena project then became, uh, you know, Kevin trying to teach lean to undergraduates. And first of all, it was undergraduates at my university. And now it's sort of undergraduates at universities anywhere in the world. But d- d- sort of developing material, uh, that's at undergraduate level, developing teaching material, and also just developing an undergraduate curriculum. Because to my genuine shock and horror, even though there have been these very spectacular projects uh, written in uh, in several theorem provers, there, was, there seemed to be no place where all the contents of one entire undergraduate degree uh, was all in one place and all compatible. You know, every, every part could play well with every other part. It somehow... Computer scientists don't think like that. That's my impression. Computer scientists like modular stuff. You know, you, you've got a little theory and you develop that theory just independently of any other theories and you get that theory compiling and you say, great, we're done. And that works with, you know, version A point B point C of your theorem prover. And then in a year's time, somebody wants to use it, but now it doesn't work anymore. You know, because, because they want to make a little, they want to make some other little piece of theory that depends on your theory. So undergraduate mathematics, it's like that. It's a gigantic web of theories depending on other theories. And you have to have everything at the same time. You see, number theory is, is the most obvious example. Number theories existed for over 2,000 years. You know, the ancient Greeks, Diophantus and Pythagoras and Euclid, you know, maybe not Pythagoras, Diophantus and Euclid were certainly doing uh, number theory. And... Uh, and number theory is kind of like a parasite. So like when other subjects come along, you know, like algebraic topology or complex analysis, number theory tends to sort of steal the ideas from these areas or try and use techniques in these areas to do more number theory. And so to actually do modern number theory, you have to be able to do everything else as well. You have to be able to do analysis and geometry and topology you know, and, and combinatorics. It's all of these things show up in modern number theory. So, you know, my dream of doing re- research level number theory, this was, this was just not impossible given the tools that were there in 2017. 
because there was no there was no undergraduate degree on which you could build. And so the, the Xena project in 2018, the main thrust of the Xena project was getting undergraduates uh, to learn how to use Lean and then to help build its mathematics library, which at that time had a very clear goal of you know becoming uh, becoming a library which covers all of undergraduate mathematics. Uh, and then by 2019, 2020, the Zeta project was my blog where I would chat about, you know, recent activities uh, in formalization and, and in particular in Lean. Uh, but then people started telling me that actually it was quite confusing uh, having it around because there was Lean, the program, and there was Lean's maths library, MathLib, and then there was the Xena project. And like, what the heck was that? Like, was it a thing? Like, what, what even was it? And people were kind of confused. I mean, this, this became a problem because the, as the area got sort of more and more visibility amongst mathematicians, uh, people couldn't tell the difference between, between MathLib and the Xena project. And that's bad. Like, MathLib is a re- repository up on GitHub, you know, with 25 maintainers, you know, serious people, none of whom are me, right? I'm not a maintainer. You know, I'm a reviewer, but I'm not a maintainer of that library. And then there was the Xena project, which was some guy on the internet saying that we should formalize, you know, lots of mathematics and in particular an undergraduate degree. And MathLib seemed to be doing exactly that. So maybe they were the same thing. So maybe MathLib was my project or maybe MathLib was the Xena project. You see, um, so by this stage, it was now getting confusing. Initially, it was just an attempt to get some publicity. Uh, but now it's now it has become confusing, and so over the last year or so, I've been blogging much less and uh, spending a lot more time, sort of devoted to growing Lean's Maths Library and, and pointing people towards it, uh, because I think the the whole Zena brand uh, just has just become a slight distraction. So that's what the Zena project is. In some sense, uh, nowadays I think. It's pretty clear what it is nowadays. Uh, nowadays, it's just it's it's the idea that undergraduate mathematicians should be learning this, and so the Zena project is forever looking uh, for ways to make that happen. For example, the Zena project runs summer. Uh, it, it ran a summer workshop this year with thirty undergraduates from around the world. Uh, you know, doing projects and where was that formalizing? That was it was run at Imperial in September this year. Uh, and uh, it was yeah I had I had funding from Imperial to to teach young mathematicians lean and I think that's what the Xena project is now becoming teaching young mathematicians uh, how to use the software because that, that, that's the nobody was doing that right? right that's the problem and and the this this workshop was like for for a week was that yeah was that, how much yeah, can you teach the students in a week so there were only thirty undergraduates there and. Um, that many more applied, but I chose the ones that had already had some lean experience. Gotcha. So th- this was the thing. Five years ago, that would have been impossible because no one had heard of it. Mm-hmm. But nowadays, math- you know, undergraduate mathematicians have heard of this stuff, and they might even have played with it. You know, we've tried to make Lean 3 very easy to set up. You know, click here, set it up, and now go ahead and start, you know, start doing some proofs. Here's some basic undergraduate stuff. You know, there's this book, Mathematics in Lean. It's like, here's how to do undergraduate math in Lean. We're walking you through it very carefully. You know, please consider, please consider joining us. And even if you don't join us, at least, you know, you've learned how to use an interactive theorem prover. That's the, you know, that's the big step, getting them to engage with interactive theorem provers at all. Young mathematicians, because they were not doing that, because nobody in the community had heard of these things. And you think you you, you reached that goal of getting people excited and having people talking and learning more about Lean? Or do you think there is still a lot more room for that? Oh, I think both. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think I've definitely succeeded in the sense that there are now plenty of young people that have heard of Lean, but there's still not enough, of course, right? Because I did. I'm, I'm now teaching a Lean course uh, at my university. Uh, I, I just start, I took, for the undergraduates. I'm teaching a, a final year undergraduate course at my university, and uh, last year, 22 people. We have 250 students in our year, and last year, 22 people came. It was the first year it ran. 
And this year I've just discovered that 71 people are registered. So that's something uh, in my university at least. But now the problem is we need lean courses or, you know, courses that talk about interactive theorem provers at least. Uh, we need them at, you know, many other universities. So so things have not finished yet. But the, the problem with getting lean courses happening at other universities is then you have to get the staff involved. And the staff are much harder. They're much harder nuts to crack because <laughs> they're like, oh, OK, I see what you're doing. That looks very cool. But I'm quite happy doing research mathematics my way. And that will not change for a long time. Well, so in my exp- um, if I if I understood how things went correctly, so one of the big reasons why Coq is so widespread in programming languages research is because we have a book that teaches Coq very well, which is Software Foundations. You've probably heard of it, right? Yeah, I translated. One of the ways I learned Lean was translating the early chapters <laughs> from Coq into Lean. That's right. Well, so so my, my point is that now that you're working on a book for mathematics in Lean, I believe that it becomes a lot a lot easier for another professor that is interested in these things to just you know like start his own course in his own own university. Yes, if if we can persuade the professor to look at undergraduate mathematics, but yes, I I think you're right. I think more and more documentation for mathematicians will start appearing. That was in fact a big problem I had at the beginning in 2017 was that uh, a lot of the uh, material I could find, a lot of the teaching material was written by computer scientists for computer scientists. So it was very clear that there was a gap in the market there. You know, in some sense, the, you know, some of the, many of the early posts in the Xena Project blog were just an attempt to talk about undergraduate mathematics in a way that mathematicians understood. You know, for, ex- you know, for example, we are not taught, I don't, I don't know if I should tell you this. <laughs> in, in mathematics departments, we're not taught what a type is, right? The word type is never mentioned in mathematics. You look, yeah, you look slightly puzzled. <laughs> the, the word type is never mentioned in an undergraduate mathematics degree. Uh, we, you, you need some generic word for a collection of stuff, right? Because you know, right. a group, a group is a collection of is a collection of things, and you can multiply the things together. But the, 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 gen, the general word that in mathematics departments we use for a collection of stuff is a set. And, uh, and that's not because we're all experts in set theory. It's because that was historically the word that was used. And you can see a group, you, you, you know, group theory cannot depend on set theory uh, because, you know, modern set theory was invented by, you know, Cantor in the late 1800s. Uh, and yet... You know, Galois invented the group, you know, sort of 40 years earlier, uh, before before the concept of set existed. So clearly you don't need set theory to do group theory. And yet, if you look at any undergraduate group theory textbook written for mathematicians, it will say a group is a set, you know, with some structure and satisfying some axioms. So the language is sort of pervasive there. So we don't teach mathematicians what sets are, uh, and we don't teach them what types are, but we never mention types. And we sometimes say the word set when we mean the word type, uh, because you know it, it would be just as ac- just as mathematically accurate to say mm-hmm. that a group was a type equipped with a multiplication right. and you know, satisfying some axioms. Although that's not what is said. So that was one one funny thing. As I I would just have to convince mathematicians that actually type theory is very very easy because type theory was the same as set theory. In, in the sense that, I'm aware that that's not true, but it is true in the sense that everything a mathematician needs to know about set theory is the same thing as everything a mathematician needs to know about type theory, which is just <laughs> that, you know, just like a set, a type is a collection of stuff, right? And that's, and that's how the term is being used. And like how they kind of work and how to make them is not really of interest to the mathematician. We, you know, we just need a word to carry around objects. But you, know, any, you take some fancy object like a, you know, a manifold or a perfectoid space, you could look at any definition of these fancy mathematical objects in the literature, and they'll all say, well, it's a set equipped with some other stuff. Right. You know, this is what it all boils down to. Maybe, so. maybe I'm mistaken, but when, when I'm reading some mathematical literature, it seems to me that some of these definitions, like said, is kind of 
hand wavy. Like, you know what this means, right? But when you're talking about this in a theorem prover, you need to be really, really specific what you mean by that. Would you agree with this? So the, the reason that you get a hand wavy impression of what a set is, is because that's the only thing that you need to know to do mathematics. And it, at my university, there is a set theory course, but it's an optional course for final year students. So even if you're doing pure mathematics, you don't have to learn about what a set is. And if you go to the set theory class, then they will teach you the definition. I mean, they won't tell you what a set is because the set is a primitive thing, but they'll tell you the axioms that sets satisfy. And they're all things that you've kind of seen lecturers do. You know, they've just, you've seen lecturers take the product of sets and you're like, okay, so you can do that. And, you know, you've seen lectures take sets of functions from a set to another set. It's like, okay, so you can do that. And you've seen them take subsets of a set. You know, after, after a while, you get the hang of what can be done. Uh, but, yeah, this is this doesn't have to be written down formally. The, the idea is you're supposed to just get the hang of it. And as you point out, in a theorem prover, just asking the theorem prover to get the hang of it is not going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that this more... You know, like, you have to be really, really formal to do theorem proving. Do you think that has aff affected anyhow how you think about mathematics? Oh, well, mathematics is a big subject. It's, it, I mean, at one end, it's hugely affected how I think about the foundations of mathematics in the sense that I now understand them properly. You know, I, I, I now know... Somehow I've known for a very long time how to build mathematics in set theory, and now I know how to build it in type theory, uh, and I can see what the differences are, and there you go. Great. So now, you know, now I know a huge amount more than I did about, say, the concept of an ordered pair, right? <laughs> right. But as a researcher, like knowing how ordered pairs work or the many different ways that you can make ordered pairs work, Uh, is of no use to me whatsoever. You know, when mm. I've got my number theory research hat on, all the things I've learned uh, from Lean, or m the yeah, uh, the vast majority of what I've learned uh, from doing Lean uh, is of no relevance at all. Because actually, knowing the nuts and bolts of how mathematics works is not a prerequisite uh, for doing research mathematics. It, and computer scientists are often very surprised about this. In fact, I. I, I've been looking very hard about the way that mathematicians are taught mathematics and the way that computer scientists are taught mathematics. And it's extraordinarily different. The, the, the way that computer scientists are taught everything in this very rule-based approach, In because in, you can imagine having to write some code that actually implements these ideas. And so you have to have the rules pretty darn straight to, to do that. And so... There is this very rule-based approach with, with computer science. I was quite surprised. Uh, whereas in mathematics, we just expect people to pick things up. There's Which the, one? The, I mean, just here, here's something that here's something that, which is expected to be obvious to a mathematician. If I'm trying to prove that every natural number has a property, we're trying to prove that for all natural numbers, blah, 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 something is true. Some statement that depends on the natural number. And so what's absolutely... What would never be said in a mathematics department is the way to prove such a statement for all natural numbers, blah, 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 is you just choose an arbitrary natural number. And then, and then for that fixed natural number, you try and prove the statement, right? And that's just, that's just obvious. That's so obvious, it would never even occur to me that one would have to write that down. <laughs> and yet, when I look at how computer scientists are taught mathematics, that this, is, this is somehow a rule. This is like a typing rule somehow. If you want to prove for all x, blah, 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 then it suffices to you know, put an arbitrary x in your context and prove it for this thing. And I'm just looking at this thinking, I can't believe that you're telling people this. This is, <laughs> this is just all obvious. But of course, all the typing rules are obvious, right? Every, yeah. Everything is obvious. Yeah. But in mathematics, we expect students to kind of figure them out themselves. We're not going to tell them the typing rules. That would be, you know, that would be a spoiler. I mean, they, <laughs> we don't ever get to the stage even where we somehow even write them down or we ever really even think about what we're doing. Everything works at a sort of an intuitive level. Don't you think that's exactly one of the problems that it's so hard to verify, to, you know, like you have this 100 pages of math, but 
most of it is kind of like, yeah, this is intuitive. I was I was reading I was I was reading one of your blog posts talking about Peter Schultz's theorem nine point four or something, how nobody even looked at it because it should be like the idea should be there or something along those lines, right? You just needed to sit down and actually formalize that. Isn't that kind of like the same thing you're talking right now? I don't think it is. So sometimes mathematicians do things, write stuff. Sometimes people skip details because any decent mathematician would be able to fill in those details. Right. Okay. And that's where we're definitely doing a bunch of stuff where and this is when I teach undergraduate mathematicians uh, to use the software, this is where you, this is really where you see them uh, tripping up because they say, well, now we're done right now. It's obvious because obviously the goal is the same as this height, you know, obviously these numbers are equal and they're, you know, well, I mean, they're not equal because, you know, this is X and this is zero plus X. And they're like, yeah, but like, obviously that's X. And you're like, well, you know, it's kind of a theorem that that's X. And they're like, no, I mean, that's probably like a definition, right? Isn't that an act? I don't know. Like, why, why obviously you cancel the zero, but you don't say, oh, I'm doing that because of a theorem. You're canceling the zero because you're a craftsman when you're being a mathematician. You know, you're working on something and, you know, every now and then you go through and you tidy things up. You, know, you replace all the zero plus X's with X's. But, you know, zero plus X and X are just equal by definition somehow because you're not really thinking. And, you know, that's not true at all, right? It's a theorem that zero plus X is X. And if you don't apply the theorem or you don't use a tactic that knows that theorem, then the system isn't going to magically change zero plus X into X for you. You know, when we when we write things down, we never put brackets. We're like a plus b plus c plus d, you know, equals a prime plus b prime plus c prime plus d prime. You know, we change a and we change b. We don't even think about where the brackets are. And when you when you start doing this in a the computer theorem prover, well, the brackets are there, and you've got to you know you've either got to move them around manually, or you get a ta- you get a tactic to move them around for you. So there's there's many many things that we skip the details of uh, because they're just any mathematician should know that. But the, the problem with Schultz's work, uh, I mean, here's, here's how the Schultz thing started. He emailed me uh, in December 2020. We, we knew each other for a, for a while before this, but he knew that I was goofing around with theorem provers. And he emailed me in December 2020 uh, and said, did you have a study group on my paper uh, at Imperial? And I said, sure, yes. You know, we met for uh, you know, a, a whatever, you know, one one a couple of hours a week during term and would read a section of your paper uh, every week and he said did you read the proof of theorem 9.4 carefully and i said no 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 just, you know we had to get through all of section nine in that afternoon so we kind of looked at the statements and sort of tried to make sure that they sort of fitted in with the view you know we have mental models we have weird pictures that we can't write down in our heads right that's what mathematical objects are just embedded as weird pictures and we have intuitions about these pictures and somebody says oh i can prove that you know x implies y and you immediately run that against the weird pictures of x's that you have in your head and the the weird pictures of y's and you try to work out whether x implies y is sort of consistent with your worldview so so this was what was happening uh, when we were reading section nine, we were just like looking at the statements of the theorems, kind of seeing if they were consistent with our worldview. Uh, and theorem 9.4 was an extremely technical, <laughs> an extremely technical statement that it was actually difficult to have a worldview for. But on the other hand, this guy's got a Fields Medal, right? You know, this is our version of the Turing Award. So he's written some technical statement. You know, you read the first few lines, it kind of looks like it might check out. And then it's like, you know, a few pages more. It looks very tedious. You know, it's not... I don't know. It doesn't look very interesting, but it sort of looks reasonable. You know, you skim through it, nothing exciting, you know, no fireworks seem to be happening. So, I mean, the guy's got a Fields medal, probably it's fine. So I explained to Schultz that we hadn't read through this proof carefully. And he remarked that he had asked several other people, and this is what all of them had said. So this was not mathematicians skipping stuff because they knew they could fill in the details. It was skipping stuff because... You know, we've just got better things to do. We've got to, we're busy people. So nobody was, nobody was reading this stuff, but it wasn't because, it wasn't because it was all too easy. Uh, it was because it was just too, so too boring. It's just too technical. <laughs> it's too technical. But, 
But Schultz made the observation that not only was it technical, it, it was technical in some sense, uh, but it was also using, t- to a large extent, just undergraduate, you know, mat- you know, ba- pretty basic mathematics. So if we had an undergraduate degree, perhaps we could check this theorem 9.4 of his. Uh, and and I thought, well, yeah, we could. And so I, you know, I got Peter to write a blog post on my blog, you know, challenging the formal proof community uh, to verify this theorem. And uh, to my excitement, you know, the lean community stood up and said, yes, we'll do it. You know, Johan Komalan and the lean community said, I will lead this project and we'll do it in lean. But to my mild disappointment, there was nobody else from any other community uh, that stood up and did it because it's, you know, it's technical mathematics and the, the other provers tend to be inhabited by computer scientists. So it's sort of weird. I mean, I'm not entirely sure that Microsoft are particularly comfortable about this situation. In fact, I think Microsoft would like Lean 4 to be an all-purpose and extremely powerful programming language uh, with, with you know, many computer science users. Uh, but at the minute, sort of, I think the view of the formalization community in general of, of the lean people is that you know it's very much dominated by mathematicians, which it is. You know, we've really pushed mathematics far further in some sense. I mean, yeah, we haven't proved the we haven't proved this odd order. Th- you know, there are there are many spectacular achievements in the other, you know, one-off projects, uh, which are very, very big and very impressive. And we haven't sort of, you know, we haven't done all of those projects in lean. Uh, but we, you know, all the ingredients are there to make an arbitrary, very large project as long as you can find the staff. So it's, it's, and it is very mathematics dominated. Uh, and I think Microsoft would like to see uh, more computer scientists using the software now. They, they've really tried to make it more. It's, Lean 4 is now, Lean 4 is compiled, not interpreted. I mean, that's one major difference. It compiles down to C. Uh, and, this is, you know, one of several things that they've changed in order to try and sort of attract uh, computer scientists in. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm I'm interested in communicating with mathematicians, and where are the mathematicians? They're, you know, the vast majority of them are using Lean, uh, because if you want to learn one of these things, you know, e.g., you've heard about the Zena project, you've heard about me saying, come on, you know, it's very important that mathematicians learn about theorem provers. But you know, which one are they going to learn? They're going to learn the one where all the other mathematicians are, right? And that's probably one of the reasons why computer scientists are still not using Lean. We, we you're still using either Koch or Isabel, sometimes Agda. Right, there's there's huge amounts, right. but Koch. I mean, I I don't know so much about Agda, but I mean, may, I don't know how old Agda is, but I know Koch and Isabel are decades old, right? They've got huge yep. amounts of infrastructure and lots mm-hmm. and lots of lots and lots of material that will be of use to computer scientists, uh, and and that's not there yet. For you see. And that's quite funny, because when you think about it, what was really motivating me back in 2017, I was just looking at this bare bones mathematics library. It was 30,000 lines long and it had, you know, basic results about finiteness, uh, you know, and a definition of the real numbers. And I was just thinking, this is great. There's so much stuff that needs to be done. You know, let's just do that stuff or, you know, let's get other people to do it. It just looks like a really fun idea. You know, let's make sine and cosine and prove that the derivative of sine is cosine. You know, let's make ring theory, field theory, Galois theory. You know, let's prove the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. That should be in, in 2017, I'd been teaching Galois theory. You know, this was a, another final year course at my university. I'd been teaching Galois theory to the third year undergraduates. And I had some really nice notes. I'd very carefully gone through the theory and um, and had written, you know, I'd, I'd really got a nice formal blueprint of the way Galois theory was set up. You know, all the details of all the proofs were there. And I just gave it, I just gave my notes to four first years and said, just go and teach your computer the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. That would be, just be an awesome thing to do, you know, and great fun. And it was it was months later that I discovered that this had never been done. This was a, this was one of the problems on Frank V. Dyke's list of 100 unsolved problems, just setting up basic you know, proving the insolvability of the quintic. I hadn't realized, but these were like open problems in computer science. And I was just telling first year undergraduates <laughs> to do them, but not, but not because I was just being naive. It was because I could absolutely see that first year undergraduates really could, you know, go a long way towards actually doing these, doing these things. 
And the first year undergraduates did it. They developed a bunch of basic field theory. Uh, and then they passed the baton over to a bunch of PhD students at UC Berkeley uh, who went on and developed Gower theory. And Gower theory got done. And uh, and in my mind, the fact that the fact that a problem which was considered as hard uh, could just be knocked off by a bunch of PhD students in their spare time uh, was, was an indication that there was a lot of potential in in this area. That actually getting mathematicians involved would really sun, suddenly kind of change the kind of things that were done. Have you seen Frake's list? Frake V Dyke has this list of like a hundred mathematical formalization challenges. And five years ago, like about 70% of it was done or something. You know, they'd done the easiest 70 and the hardest 30 was still open. And now, as, as of uh, as of Jan 1st, 2023, like 99 of them have been done. 99 of these mathematical challenges have been formalized. Um, and the 100th one is Fermat's last theorem, which we're actively working on. You know, this is a monumental proof by my advisor and his advisor. Uh, of Fermat's last theorem in the 90s. So when I was watching you giving your Microsoft talk, I think three years ago, you were very excited to start this project where you would start developing this library where undergrads, you would have all math, undergrad mathematics there. Yeah. Do you think that is done now? Well, it depends. The, the problem is the definition of undergraduate mathematics is like a mathematician's definition. Right? It's not. <laughs> it's not been pinned down. Right. Right. You know, is you take take you know, Galois theory. That's that's certainly in the undergraduate degree that I taught. But probably there are universities out there that don't teach Galois theory. So what actually is in an undergraduate degree? But you could look at you could look at the twelve courses which I took uh, in my final year as an undergraduate, and you could say which of those twelve courses do we now have? And uh, the big ones that are missing, there's some complex analysis missing, and there's some differential geometry missing. So we don't have everything that I learned as an undergraduate, but we do have the vast majority of what I learned as an undergraduate. You know, there's just really two, two or three major missing courses. And these will happen, you know, over the next two years or so, they will just they will just happen organically as, as people come along and, and want them or need them for other projects. So they'll, they'll just make them. So the undergraduate degree is happening just sort of organically. Right, right. But is it done? It depends on what you mean. Do you think the math lab is now powerful enough to handle modern mathematics, current research mathematics? So we, we proved that it is, right? This, I mean, we, we proved this theorem of Schultz uh, and uh, other, other, things have, other things have happened as well. I mean, here's, here's another example. In, um, in late 2021, uh, a postdoc in Oxford called Thomas Bloom, uh, he proved an old conjecture of Erdős, an old conjecture of Erdős and Graham um, about unit fractions. And uh, this, you know, there was this was sort of exciting news in the analytic number theory community, or, or you know, additive combinatorics, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, Bloom then started collaborating with a PhD student uh, in Cambridge, Bavik Mehta, uh, on formalising this proof in Lean. So this was a you know a, a 2021 proof, and by 2022, six months later, they'd formalised the whole thing, and uh, you. Of, the paper was short, 20 pages, but obviously had many references. So they had to formalize lots and lots of things. And, you know, they had to formalize things like the Hardy Littlewood circle method, you know, an instance of that. You know, this, you know, this is something that goes back to the, you know, the, uh, the, the early part of last century. But um, th this, this was all doable in lean, you know, in a small, finite time. And at the end of it, six months later, uh, they had a fully formalized proof of this conjecture of, Erdős and Graham, and uh, Bloom Bloom hadn't got his paper back from the referees yet. <laughs> it hadn't been reviewed yet, but it so had been he, formally checked. <laughs> so he there there was one 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 of his students did it could could do the paper in one year. Is that what you said? So Bloom is a postdoc in Oxford, and he he proved the theorem in the regular way, paper and pencil, and submitted that wrote up the paper and submitted it. 
And then Bavik Mehta, who's a PhD student to Tim Gowers in Cambridge, just collaborated with him. He knew Bloom because Bloom had taught him a class a couple of years earlier. He collaborated with Bloom and translated the proof from pen and paper into lean. In just a year. Yeah. And it's six months. Six months. That was yeah, really six- quick. But that's, that, was, that wasn't a full-time project, right? That's right. Some, something they were doing on the side. Wow. Yeah, because Meta is you know, a PhD student working on something else. A lot, a, lot of people are, a lot of people in the math community are just doing this stuff for fun, right? No, but that's my point. It was, it was actually quick because for, for, formalizing this stuff is, 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 non, is very non-trivial. It takes a lot of time and effort. And it requires someone to be an expert, like know how to do these things, right? Like know how to... Talk to Lean, how to... Yeah, pro- Meta, Meta was already an expert yeah, in Lean. Yeah. He, he had already formalized a whole bunch of combinatorics and, and many other things too. He'd contributed to the Schultz project. He'd done some stuff with Topos theory. Uh, he'd, he'd done a bunch of stuff. He was certainly already a world expert in Lean. But then the fact that he just kind of knocked off some additive combinatorics in, in real time, I thought was very exciting. And, and I don't really see why we can't be doing that sort of thing for... For many papers which are coming out right now, I think I think we 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 have got to that point. Yeah, modern modern mathematics. Certain mathematics is gigantic. <laughs> right. Certain areas of modern mathematics are feasible, right? Certain other areas we still need to do the foundations. We can't prove Fermat's last theorem in six months, right? You know that's going to take you know, that's that's going to take a very long time. It's going to take you know a decade. It's going to take longer maybe, depending on how many people get involved, because we just have to build what Wiles work. You know, sits on many, many other people's. But it's really built on many, many other people's work, and we will have to formalize, uh, you know, uh, the whole machinery of modern algebraic geometry and you know some modern analysis as well. Uh, it's it's you know a, a lot of work needs to be put in before you know, we we could certainly form we could we could write down the root. You know, it's like here's five theorems. And the claim is that each theorem implies the next theorem, and the last theorem is Fermat's last theorem. We could write down the roots because formalizing the definitions. I have a PhD student working on this already. Uh, the, the, the definitions which are used uh, in the Wiles and Taylor Wiles work, uh, but but actually proving the theorems that each one of these theorems implies the one afterwards. You know, each one of those problems is a very difficult problem. You know, the, the Wiles's work. The first thing Wiles's work uses is a theorem of Mazur uh, about elliptic curves, and already that theorem of Mazur will be very, very complicated. It will be a long time before we see that theorem of Mazur formalized. Uh, and that you know that's stuff from the seventies. That's just old standard stuff. <laughs> e- that's, that's easy. It's, <laughs> we forget we forget how difficult it is because. You know, in 1960, Rothendieck had this revolution in algebraic geometry and invented this new, very, very complex theory that started solving old problems. One of the problems it solved was the vague conjectures, and another one it solved was you know this old problem about torsion and elliptic curves. But it was solved by this gigantic machine that takes thousands of pages to set up. So those thousands of pages were set up in the 1960s, and then they were used in the 1970s to do various things. And now, fifty years later, we look back and think, "Well, this is all standard stuff." <laughs> but, but we've forgotten that actually it, it might be standard, but it's also you know a thousand pages that needs to be formalized. Okay, and that's just Mazur's theorem. And then Wiles's yeah. theorem needs Mazur's theorem. I see. You know, and it needs you know it needs other theorems as well. Right. So it's but I don't see any reason that we can't do it. Mm-hmm. I, well, I would love. To, I'd like to get a computer. I'd like to get an AI to do it. But <laughs> you, you guys haven't sorted that out for me yet, right? You don't think? You, what What are your thoughts on on? Well, before before I ask about OpenAI, there there is something else bothering me that I want to ask, which is um, so this is a growing field. This is a, a a field that is being born. It's formally verified by a computer. Mathematics, mathematics yeah. formally verified by a computer. Do you think that the mathematicians are open for this field in the sense that in order for you to push this forward, you need publications. That's how that's how researchers work. We need publications, right? I don't know how, how things are in Europe, but in, in the US, you definitely, either you publish or you or perish, right? <laughs> so do you think that your field is open for having venues and more venues accepting and being happy about this sort of work? Yeah, this is a very important question, and 
it's complicated. So right now, what are the things that we're formalizing? I mean, who is in the area? In the, the vast majority of people working in the area are doing this in their spare time, right? They're doing regular research during the day, and then they're formalizing stuff that's already understood in the evening, right? And uh, you know, there's nothing that's been formalized so far. Even all this formalizing, all this glorious work of Peter Schultzer and Dustin Clausen, this is all formalizing stuff that humans had already worked out, right? There's no new research there. And traditional mathematical journals publish new research. So there's not really a space in that traditional body of mathematics journals uh, to publish research, unless the, re- unless the research is really telling you something new about the mathematics. And that does very occasionally happen. Uh, for example, you know, just to give one example, uh, part of the proof of the Schultzer clausen result uh, was was a, a very technical thing called the Breen, you know, the, the Breen Deline resolution, which needed a lot of stable homotopy theory and you know a, a lot of mathematics that otherwise wasn't going to be necessary in the proof. And Johann Commelen kind of thought about the kind of you know, he he wrote down very carefully exactly what we needed from this area, you know, from this black box before we'd made the black box. And then he observed that actually you didn't need the full force of the black box. You needed, you needed something simpler. And he could make, he could make the simpler object uh, in a in a, he could make the simpler object with his bare hands and didn't need to go on a sidetrack and developing all the theory of stable homotopy groups of spheres and this complicated stuff that we wanted to avoid. So Comelan did have some insight that made the mathematical proof simpler. And one can imagine that sort of thing being publishable, but. Even that, it's pretty tenuous, really. Like I've simplified part of a proof. It's like, okay, is that substantial enough to be a publication? You know, really, the substantial piece of work is, you know, teaching the computer, you know, pages and pages of mathematics, and that's that's the you know that's where the content is. So at the minute, we're just getting to the point now where we don't really know where we sit because it's not original research. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that the tools will ultimately help mathematical researchers to do research more efficiently. You know, that's, I think that's, that's a target, right? Make, make algebraic geometry chatbots where you just type, you know, you, you, you've you got some algebraic geometry question, you type it into the chatbot and the chatbot says, yeah, okay, that's actually in my database of theorems. You might not have the proofs, right? But this is my database of formalized theorems, or oh, it's in my database of counter examples. You know, this is not true. Or you know, he, here's some recent theorems in my database of recently proved theorems in algebraic geometry that might help with this. You, know, so you can imagine that AI would get quite good at that once we have a nice database. But until we've got to that point where we we're, we're making deliverables which are useful to mathematicians, mathematicians are not going to be buying into this. So the whole mathematical ecosystem right now is looking at us, going, "What exactly is the point of what you're doing? You know, is it is it going to change mathematics?" And in some sense, they're also saying, "And let me know when it does." Right? <laughs> and, and, and until right. until then, you know, what are we doing? We, we've got this huge amount of work to do, you know, building all the theory. But then the computer scientists, it, the the natural places to publish in computer science. The kind of publications they like are, are we try to invent a complicated mathematical object in this type theory or in this foundation? Oh, and it turned out that the foundations weren't quite suited or it turns out the way the foundations were implemented weren't quite suited to this definition. So he has some interesting problems. You know, this definition should work, but it timed out. And there was an interesting bug and we had to work around it or maybe not a bug or, you know, a feature, whatever it was. We had to work around it and that was kind of interesting. And eventually we got our definition and we proved this theorem. But, you know, but along on, on the way, it was a struggle to implement this object because this object had little technicalities that, uh, that are not often stressed in the human literature, but the computer found them out. They, they, the computer science journals like that kind of thing. But we're not giving them that either, right? Because Lean's got good at mathematics. This is the problem. The, the kind of things, the kind of papers that people are writing now like here's a, here's a substantial piece of mathematics we formalized it to a large extent it went great you know there, there was a, just a couple of issues you know we found we found a weird bug 
But to a large extent, you know, one of my postdocs managed to find a declaration. She she wrote down a theorem statement and she sorted the proof and Lean just timed out. Like, like Lean would refuse, or, or Lean would give an error. Lean would complain that the definition hadn't been marked computable, hadn't been marked non-computable. So then you mark the definition non-computable and then it complained that it should be computable. It's like, couldn't work out if the definition was non-computable or computable because there was some sort of internal internal check going on mm-hmm. that was that was failing because the definition had become so complex you know it was non-computable but the non-computability was hidden very deep down uh-huh. uh, in a in a very computable like structure and so you know so then the you know, the development couldn't really proceed anymore uh because the declaration was just timing out and so then you ask the you know the computer scientists and they debug it and they find the problem and they you know they beef up uh, you know, they give us non-computable exclamation mark, which solves, you know, which demands, you know, it says, stop trying to check that this is computable. I'm telling you it's non-computable. And that was great. And so there you go. There's a paper that had some advanced mathematics in, but also, you know, it uncovered some problems uh, with Lean 3. But the, the majority of the mathematics we do does not uncover problems. Uh, so now, where, so where does it go? If it doesn't go in the traditional math channels, and it doesn't go in the computer science formalization journals. Where where is it going to go? And you see, I'm all right, Jack, because I'm an established researcher. You say that it's publish or perish, but I mean, I'm just publishing survey articles and things like this. I'm not, you know, I'm just I'm unfortunately I've become a manager now. You know, I've done very little lean formalization of research mathematics in the in the last year or so. I tend to be, you know, directing PhD students and postdocs towards it. And I'm not attempting to publish, you know, papers about research level formalization. I, I mean, yeah, you know, I've been doing the liquid tensor experiment, but that was somehow, that was somehow it. And that was, you know, that's a big joint project anyway. So I don't. This is a problem. I mean, you've you've highlighted a problem. Where's it going to go? There's experimental mathematics. This is a great journal. This is a slightly, you know, slightly out of the ordinary journal uh, that's very happy to publish uh, mathematical experiments. And I did an experiment with some first-year undergraduates. We um, we began algebraic geometry. We formalized Groff and Dijk's definition of a scheme. Uh, me and four me and four first-year undergrads, and we wrote that paper up and we submitted it to Experimental Mathematics, and they took it. So there's one place it can go, but that's just one journal, Experimental Mathematics. So I yeah I don't really know. I mean, there's been talk of setting up there's been talk of setting up our own journal. You now I I. I yeah, I, I'm in my 50s, right? I've been in the game for a long time. I have some influential friends. I, I, I'm aware that it would probably be possible to you know, get a journal. or, But I'm just a little bit concerned about this approach. Like, We could have the Kevin Buzzard journal. I mean, it wouldn't be called that. But like, <laughs> say Kevin Buzzard is the managing editor, right? right? Say I'm in charge. And then what do I do? I just spend the next few years you know, accepting papers by my friends. Like, that does not look... <laughs> yeah. Because who's going to be submitting if the journal is about formalization of mathematics, who's going to be submitting to it? Because there aren't that many people doing formalization of mathematics in the other prover communities. I mean, there are some, but uh, you know, and, and, but even those doing mathematics is often very foundational. You know, I want to, I want to do, I want to do the kind of maths that's happening in my maths department. You know, fancy modern mathematics, and and you only really find those kinds of people in the lean community. So it will just be. Me, you know, me publishing papers by my friends, and that is not a good look. And that's one of several reasons as to why I haven't gone down this route yet. Uh, so in some sense, you're asking me, you know, I'm building a team in London. I'm, I'm training people to be experts in this area. And now I just kind of like leading them off a cliff. <laughs> right? Am I, just, am, I, am I just walking them, you know, into, into you know, research disaster? And all the all the time, every, every all the time, that's a real that's a question that's genuinely, you know, in my head all the time. You know, is this actually a good idea? And what's happened over the last few years is I occasionally I get reinforced. I get I get things happen which convince me that yes, it's still a good idea. For example, right back in 2017, when I was teaching undergraduates to formalize the work of Groth and Deke in a theorem prover, I was thinking, these people could be doing their homework, right? They come into my club on a Thursday night. They could be doing. They, they could be working on what they're supposed to be. They could be doing their problem sets. You know, 
the stuff that their lecturers, you know, as I'm teaching them this weird new skill that might not be of any use to them. And, uh, you know, it, and, uh, am I just actually derailing their derailing their degree? So of those four undergraduates who were co-authors on the paper with me, uh, all four of them are now doing PhDs. So there's one example. You know, so the fact that I taught them, not all in theorem provers. Uh, are, they, are, are they still using theorem provers in their PhDs? So three of them are. Okay. Uh, and one of, one of them is doing regular. Cool. Kenny Lau is doing a regular maths PhD in Cambridge, uh, and and the other three uh, are all are all yeah they're all using they're all using theorem provers in their work. So maybe here's what's gonna happen: you are training people to kind of found this new sort of branch in mathematics, in a sense, and then once they become professors, then you're gonna see this area blooming right but will they become professors because people will look at their cvs and say well this is a <laughs> this is a weird cv but that's true just to, just to give two recent examples you know in the last few months johan komalan who was a, a my collaborator and a, a postdoc in freiburg he has got a tenure job in the netherlands so that's something and maria inesh de frutos fernandez my postdoc has been doing some brilliant work um has been doing some brilliant work in the theory of local fields. And uh, she has been given a postdoc in uh, Madrid. So she's managed to get another job. And furthermore, they asked her uh, to teach a lean course in, this, in, in a mathematics department. They've asked her if she will teach a lean course when she moves there next month. So, so you see there are things, again, these are just examples yep. that, that, that slowly but surely, you know, the community, there's, there's a guy, there's a, there's a guy on the faculty at Harvard who will be teaching, uh, who will be teaching a lean course. Yeah. The, I guess starting in a couple of weeks time. So slowly, slowly, you know, the communities are realizing that actually right, right. this stuff is happening. So maybe the community is not ready to, you know, like dive into the area, but they're kind of ready to embrace people who are right as giving positions and things like that. Yeah, that may, hmm. maybe that's what's happening. But really, the area is very, very small. You know, I've, it moved, is. From, I've moved from a very big, the, the formalizing mathematics, you know, in particular that, rather than formalizing in general, I'm aware that people are formalizing many, many things. But formalizing mathematics, this is in some sense a tiny, I used to be, you know, an algebraic, I mean, I still am an algebraic number theory. I, I identify as a number theorist still. And the number theory community is gigantic. Uh, so I've moved from this very large community to this rather smaller community, but I still have my eyes on what the large community are doing. And uh, yeah, we, we shall see, you know, as long as I keep trying to drive the small community, you know, to, towards the kind of mathematics which the large community are doing, I'm hoping that the large community will see this, you know, and somehow understand that perhaps we're adding some potential future value to their area. You know, it's it's really surprising to me in the sense how number theory is still such a lively research because it's so old. I, I learned I learned a little bit of, of number theory. So the, the kind of number theory that I have in my head is like, okay, let's do induction over natural numbers sort of little things, you know. What is what is number theory nowadays? So the number theory will exist forever because of Matthew Savage's theorem, right? What is that? He, he, he proved that number theory was undecidable. <laughs> Just okay. the basic questions of you know whether polynomials have got solutions, you know, in in, in integers. This question is undecidable. Uh, so the, what what number theory is? You know, the, the thing that you know, we mentioned Diophantus already. The thing that Diophantus was doing two and a half thousand years ago was he would write down a polynomial equation and then he would ask, they would ask, does there exist a solution? You know, he's like X squared minus, you know, minus seven Y squared equals one, right? Is there an integer solution to that equation? You know, that's, you, you, we could try some examples and look around and try and find something. And now X squared, X squared minus D Y squared is one. We have that, we understand that question now. Yeah, we have a, we have a theory for that question and uh, it's essentially resolved. So, okay, so now we can do, we can solve quadratic equations in two variables, you know. <laughs> so now what about x cubed minus 3y cubed equals 1? You know, now it turns out you're on the boundary of modern research. Cubic equations in two variables, this is, uh, 
you know, their arithmetic is conjecturally understood, uh, but not, but not, you know, the, the, we have we have a conjectural picture, but the theorems aren't proved. The Birch and Swinnerton die conjecture. This is a conjecture about you know, solutions to cubic equations in two variables. And then for equation, you know, but now what about you know equations of degree five in two variables? That now or equations of degree three in three variables? You, you, there's there's an infinite source of problems. <laughs> and what we know from Matiasevich and related work is that there's not going to be any algorithm that will ever come along and say, you give me any polynomial in any number of variables of any degree, and here's the algorithm which tells you whether it has a solution or not. Right? That, that algorithm does not exist. And so because, because that's beyond mathematics, what we can do is just keep going further and further in and finding new methods which kind of sort of partially work or will work for some larger class of equations. But there will always be equations that we haven't done yet because of Matthew Savage. So, so number theory will last forever. You see, and the... you mentioned that you use pretty much all of the branches of mathematics to solve this sort of questions. How, how, does, that, how does that work? Yeah, yeah, that's really funny. Because given, given an equation in two variables, uh, if I'm interested in the integer solutions or the rational solutions, I mean... That sounds like a discrete problem. Instead, you could consider the real or complex solutions to an equation. And that's a graph, right? And so that's a geometric object. And so uh, you could ask yourself whether the geometry of the geometric object uh, affects uh, the arithmetic you know, of, of the discrete object. You could ask yourself whether geometric facts you know, about the drawing of all real or complex solutions. Like, who cares about... It's very easy to find a real solution to x squared minus 7y squared is 1, right? Because you just let y be anything. You just let y be 37. And then you just let x is the square root of something, right? But most numbers, their square roots are not whole numbers. So, so it kind of feels like two different questions, solving equations in real numbers and solving equations in whole numbers. But actually, it turns out that there are extremely profound links uh, between the topology or the geometry of an equation, you know, the, or the geometry of its of its real or complex solutions, and the arithmetic of an equation. So these are these are very profound and, and complex observations that take a long time to even kind of state precisely. But uh, you know, somehow the simplest example of it. Uh, is Folting's theorem that he got the Fields Medal for in the 1980s. So I was saying that if you just have one equation in two variables, then if you draw the complex solutions and count the number of count the number of like the complex solutions might look like a donut or something like this, or a donut with ten holes in, and somehow the number of holes in the complex solutions has a has a strong effect uh, on the behaviour of the integer solutions to these problems. So. There's, there's, yeah, there's some weird stuff going on, and in some sense, we, yeah, number theory is a big mystery, really. But we're just driven by this, driven by this idea of getting algorithms, you know, to solve you know, polynomial equations in whole numbers or polynomial equations in rational numbers. That's in some, one of the main things that that drives us forward. Uh, and I mean, primes are another thing, right? Prime, there are many unsolved problems about prime numbers. Those are only hundreds of years old. Most of the unsolved problems. But again, you know, in some sense, the Riemann hypothesis is one of them. That can be interpreted as a very hard question about prime numbers. But just even goofy questions like, are there infinitely many primes P such that P plus 2 is a prime? Or are there infinitely many primes P such that 2P plus 1 is a prime? You know, is every, is every even number bigger than 4 the sum of two prime numbers? These are all unsolved problems. These are phenomenally hard problems, which many, many people have put a lot of effort into so it just turns out that math is hard and it, it, yeah, number theory number theory is an extremely difficult subject and so yeah so it goes on and on and on that's 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 pretty cool that's pretty cool what about this you, you mentioned about liquid this liquid tensor experiment what is that so that was when, back when Schultzer made the observation that no one had proved his theorem 9.4 uh he he challenged the community to prove 
another theorem of his, theorem, well, a, a theorem of his and Clausen's theorem 9.1 uh, in this preprint that he has. And uh, he, it was a, there's a band, right? Liquid tension experiment. Oh. Uh, that both him and uh, Johan Komalan, the guy that decided to take up the challenge, uh, were fans of. So it was a pun on the name of liquid tension experiment. But uh, what it was, uh, was a challenge to formalize a proof of one specific uh, theorem in, in modern mathematics. But the, the issue is, when the challenge was made, it was completely impossible to even state the challenge uh, in any of the available systems, because it just involved, you know, it involved sort of complex objects of the kind that had never been formalized before. So it took a while even to state the question, but the, the liquid tensor experiment uh, was was the was the challenge of formally verifying you know, what, one of the theorems of modern mathematics in any theorem prover, and it was you know it was a uh, yeah we won the, you know the the lean community managed to you know complete a formalization of this uh, in July twenty two, so that that's what it was and it was great it was very collaborative it was ten people working together there were some leaders and there were some followers. I was kind of a follower I wasn't really a leader. There were people that were really planning out you know, what order to do things and making very precise what needs to be done. And then every now and then they say, oh, you know, we just need we just need a development. We just need a development of the following API. You know, you know I knew the mathematics. They would just sort of say, you know, here's, here's the API. We need we need these properties of complexes. And, you know, and here's the theories we want and here's the definitions we want. Can you just go and make them? You know, and then I would go away and spend a couple of weeks working hard to, or, you know, or a week or so working hard to make the API they wanted and then just fill it in. Because when it got to the point uh, where they could just write down, you know, this is the glorious thing about form. We, we, it, was, it was all top down, right? This is a very different thing to the way computer scientists work. When, uh, so I entered the area in 2017, 2018, and instantly I was suggesting top down formalizations. And people, you know, serious people in the computer science community were really pushing me away from that idea because they, they all knew horror stories. It's like, ah, you know, you, you start at the top and you kind of, you make this definition and you state this theorem and everything's fine and you you write many, many thousands of lines of code. And then when you kind of try to glue things together at the end, things don't glue together because of some oversight you had. And this definition isn't equal to this definition and there's a problem and all the work is wasted. You know, people would tell me example after example of, you know, why don't start at the top. You know, just build build up lemma after lemma and start at the bottom. But that's that's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it, I think the nature of the kind of things we're formalizing in Lean and the kind of things which are being formalized in, in difficult problems in computer science, I just think the very nature of the formalizations is different. To... To give one reason why I think that's true, the kind of mathematics I've formalized, I understand that mathematics really well, right? It's, it's not, this is all a big unknown and the theorem prover is helping us and, you know, we don't quite know how this stuff is going to work, right? It's, it's not that at all. Like, we know the theory back to front. We know what the definitions look like. They're not complicated. They're not complicated inductive types. There are no, in, there are essentially no inductive types in mathematics, other than the natural numbers and structures. All, all of the inductive types you see in, in some of the large bodies of formalization that have shown it, it's, it's they're very basic, they're very basic objects. And but we know the theorems, right? We know how they work. This is, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the times it's standard stuff. So we can state the theorems correctly. If somebody states a theorem and it's not correctly stated, somebody else will spot that very quickly. You know, even before you start embarking on the proof. It's, it's possible to read mathematical statements and have a very, very strong opinion that, you know, this is, even though the proof is going to be thousands of lines long and we haven't started on it yet, because, because you can read the statements and you know that they correspond to statements that you can prove in pen and paper, you know that they're right. So, we, so very early on, we started by formalizing the statements of what we wanted and then formalizing the basic definitions of the things that we were going to we, we were going to need to put them together, and then we work downwards to a large extent, just filling in API and and building things. Yeah, we would work upwards sometimes and downwards some other times. But it was that we had that additional flexibility. That I, my impression is, computer scientists are quite scared uh, 
to, to embrace. My impression th- is that risk involved. You guys understand what you're doing much better than we do. <laughs> do, do, do I, I, you could put it like, if we wanted to be rude to computer scientists, we could put it like that. But I, I think there's another way of looking at it. Whereas what's going on is that many people in the computer science community are using proof assistance to actually assist them with their proofs. You know, they're kind of helping. They're keeping track of stuff. Whereas that's not really what's going on in mathematics. A lot of the mathematics that's being formalized is that we we know we have the paper proof already and it's extremely well understood. And what we just need is we need to get it into the system because we need it for something else or we need it for a database. It's So I think what's happening is, is that actually... We we know we've we've worked out the details already. Sometimes you guys are working out the details on the fly, and that's actually you. You see that you mentioned Agda earlier. You see that in the univalent community for sure. The the univalent people they have reached nirvana, right? They they're using a type theory which is so complex because because of the univalence axiom that that you know what a type the type is some kind of you know it's an infinity groupoid. It's a really complicated object. And so proving things about their types is so complicated that it's really important and useful to have a to have a theorem prover around where you can just check that you filled in all the details because you know, the definition of an infinity group point is such a complex thing. So trying to manage this stuff on paper is going to be difficult. Whereas in in you know this more conventional, if you like, whatever you want to call it, the kind of mathematics I do, you know, modern number theory. That, that's that's not what's happening at all. Yeah. Usually, uh, another thing I also see sometimes is that the, the kind of proofs that we're doing, they're not particularly insightful. They're just big. They're just a lot of state going on that is really hard to keep in your head too. But they're uh-huh. not insightful. They're not insightful at all. They're just, you know, like churning the, the wheels to get somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mathematics... There are there are sort of brilliant ideas around, and after a while, you manage to you know get find the right level of abstraction for those brilliant ideas, and and then build things together. But it's just that no, there are things going on in a mathematical proof for sure, but it's just that they're very well understood because historically mathematics has existed you know for, for a long time before computers existed, so the form that we ended up having, you know, writing down these brilliant ideas. Is, is is PDF basically, which turns out to be unsuitable to be auto translated. So now we have to do doing it manually. But yeah, there's, it, there, there's lots and lots of brilliant ideas in in the in you know the the existing lean corpus. You know, really really good stuff. I think that we we, you know, we are at the point now where we can write down you know, interesting lemmas in commutative algebra and uh, and prove them. And sometimes the proofs are short. Sometimes the proofs are short but brilliant, uh, but you, things are, yeah, things mathemat- Yeah, we, we're definitely at the point where things are mathematically going on. In the and, sense yeah, of, it, you think that it, now computers can start helping you to think about what you're it, doing. And it, it's definitely got to the point where it's not so difficult to explain brilliant ideas to the computer. Whether the computer can now go and use them and understand them, and start telling us. You know, either use this brilliant idea, or even why don't you have why don't you use a new brilliant idea that I've come up with? I, I think we're still a long way, we're still a long way from that. But we're we're typing exciting mathematics into the computer. That's where we are, and maybe in computer science, that's just not what it looks like. It's it's the, the majority of what you're doing is is somehow it's this is a proof by a very long structural induction. Oh. Yeah, that these proofs do not. It's, these proofs don't really exist. Pro- proofs by induction are extremely rare in mathematics. The, the, only induct- <laughs> the only induction we ever really do is induction on the natural numbers. That's that's what it's, we do. That's fun. all that we do in computer science. It's proof by induction, really. If, well, if you want to prove the programs are correct, right? Then then somehow you're modeling your program. You know, the commands are some very elaborate inductive type or something. And now, I remember I remember in some of your of your talks you mentioned that there there one of the reasons you thought that lean was was one of the best choices, or at least you know something with dependent type theory, is that there were some structures that were that needed some dependent types. I think I think it was something like perfectoid space, something like that. Yes, yeah, some, yeah, foundations. So 
my guess is that you can probably do all of mathematics in any foundation in theory. But, <laughs> but the question is, how possible is it to do it in practice? And what the lean community has shown is that it's definitely possible to do chunks of modern research mathematics in practice using dependent type theory. So is it possible to do chunks of modern mathematics in simple type theory? I mean, probably yes, but but what about the types of modern mathematics that I'm personally interested in? And th this was the worry, uh, this was the worry I had about simple type theory, that if you want to do modern algebraic geometry, dependent types are everywhere. It's, it's naturally set up using the theory of dependent types. And so now the question is, well, okay, that might be the case, but normally there are clever workarounds, right? You know, it, like, because you can't do, you can't do R to the N in Isabel. In some sense, you can't do R to the N, right? You can't do N dimensional vector space over the reals because N is a, you know, R to the N is a type that depends on the, depends on the natural number N. But they have tricks for, for dealing with this. And so similarly, I suggested in 2019 or so, I suggested that it might be impossible uh, to, to define even the basic definitions of modern algebraic geometry uh, in a simple type theory. And, uh, you know, and Larry Paulson and his gang in Cambridge, they proved me wrong. You know, they, <laughs> they, they, they went ahead and, and they gave a definition. And uh, the definition is not satisfactory in some sense because they needed these mathematical objects called rings uh, which are naturally set up in one way, but they had to set up ring theory in a different way. And once there's, I mean, it was there, the different way was set up already. I mean, this, th so they have these Grothendieck object schemes, but they use a definition of ring, which is not the standard definition. So now in the archive of formal proofs, there are two definitions of a ring. And in my mind, that's not satisfactory. I mean, lean, in Lean's maths library, there's one definition of a ring, and that one definition, whenever you need a ring, you have to use the way that we implemented it. Whereas now we have two definitions of a ring in Isabel Hall. So the question is, is this going to scale? So if we want to, if we want to make some more algebraic, this is, you see, this is the problem I have. I now have 10 more questions. Now, my first question was, <laughs> can you define schemes in simple type theory? And this has been answered. The answer is yes. So now I have 10 more questions about what we can do, you know, they're more complex. But the problem is who in the Isabel community is an expert in algebraic geometry that's prepared to take those tiles on? And the answer is nobody, because all the experts in algebraic geometry are coming to lean <laughs> because they can see, because we're making, you know, we've got a huge algebraic geometry directory in Lean's maths library. You know, algebraic geometry is, is, has got a lot of momentum. It's happening. We just recently got funding for an algebraic geometry in Lean conference. At, uh, at AIM in California. We, this was just, I don't know if it's been, I mean, I've been told informally. Yeah, it's, it's up on some website somewhere. But, you know, algebraic geometry and lean has a lot of momentum. But it's, I'm finding it very difficult uh, to make that momentum happen in the other theorem provers. And, and, and the reason I think is that, in some sense, lean is, in some sense, a victim of its own success in mathematics. In the sense that I'm going around trying to get mathematicians interested in theorem provers, but I show them lean because it's the one I know. And so then they come and do lean because it's the one they were shown. So can simple type theory do more advanced algebraic geometry in a reasonable way? I, I just don't know. And I wonder whether we'll ever find out. So it's sort of a funny, it's a funny situation, but that's that's where we are right now. I would love a bunch of algebraic geometers to develop huge amounts of algebraic geometry in both both Isabel Hall. So Koch, I'm sure, can do it because Lean can do it. And Lean and Koch's type theory is sufficiently similar for me to be convinced that we can do algebraic geometry. That's dependent types as well. Right, so now there's the question, is simple type theory good enough? Unknown problem. Don't know if anybody's working on it. And then, then the question is, can univalence help? Can it be done constructive? Because we also use the law of the excluded middle everywhere because Grothendieck uses it. You know, can it be done constructively if you use the univalence axiom? And now that's a question for the ACTA people. And very recently, we've had some action in the ACTA family. We, you know, we've had a we've had a definition of affine schemes, which is the start. You know, it's not schemes, but it's a start. 
and uh, and you know, will there be people doing more algebraic geometry in Agda? That I, I just don't know. I, I think these these questions are very complicated because we don't have the staff to answer. They're, they're very natural questions. What can be done in simple type theory? Well, for sure, a lot of 19th century mathematics can. It's very good at you know, classical complex analysis, the kind of stuff that Riemann was doing. You know, it's, it's clearly very good at that. And, you know, Manuel Eberl has shown us this. Uh, and and you know, early 20th century mathematics, sure. But when there was this sort of revolution, this abstraction revolution, you know, these abstract concepts, uh, like you know, category theory came along, and then you know, algebraic geometry came along using category theory. Can it do that? I just don't know. I just don't know. Is it these? <laughs> I, I don't. I, part of me doesn't care. <laughs> we 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 need lots lots of maths in one system, and I don't really care what that system is. But at the minute, it looks like we've got one system that's going to do it. You know, if if competing systems want to have a go, that's fine. But it's going to be a huge. You know, there's still a huge amount of work to be done. To get us a rope, you know, a, a basic, you know, great. We've got, we might, you know, arguably we've got an undergraduate degree, but like, why don't we get a master's program? You know, that's the next thing. Why don't we get a full master's program? What kind of tools can computer scientists build to make mathematicians' life easier to use interactive theorem provers? Oh, this is a this is an easy question to answer because I've seen it happen. Uh, with Lean, I was, I couldn't prove that one was less than two. Right in in 2017 when I started for natural numbers, sure, but for real numbers, Lean had the real numbers, but it couldn't prove that one. I, I couldn't even prove that one was not equal to two, right? And to a mathematician, a mathematician would find it really hard to work out even what the question is. What does the question mean? <laughs> what like, is this? Of, of, of course, one is not equal to two. Like it doesn't need a proof, right? Like you right. you draw you draw the real number line, <laughs> and there's a dot there for one, and there's a dot one unit away from it for two. <laughs> And the dots aren't in the same place. And so one is not equal to two. So I was just like, if the system can't prove that one is not equal to two, then this is never going to work. You know, I need to, I want to use this in my teaching. The system's never going to work. And Mario Carnero came along and just wrote a tactic called norm num that just, that just, that solved this problem. And then, you know, so tactics, that's, that's the simple answer is the simple part of the simple answer. Uh, we, you know, we get stuck on, we get, we do stuff intuitively in our heads uh, that um, the computers can't do. And so, yeah, so we need, I mean, we need tactics. So another example, uh, there was an undergraduate proving that every natural number is the sum of four squares. That's kind of a cool thing. Uh, and they had to do a lot of algebra uh, and they were missing a ring tactic you know, just something that basically would prove algebraic identities in the integers. You know, a, a x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Uh, so they were having to do this by hand, just rewriting axioms of a ring and of a group. Uh, and so, you know, again, Mario Carnero, the same guy, wrote a, wrote a ring tactic, just stole, I mean, Asiya, Asiya Mabubi and... Uh, uh, Benjamin Gregoire wrote a ring tactic in Cock and documented what they'd done very carefully. Uh, and the documentation was sufficiently coherent and well-written that it was possible to just port the tactic over to Lean. And, uh, yeah, so they, there's been tactics to do you know, to, to do inequalities, to prove that functions are continuous, to prove identities in group theory, to prove that, to prove that real numbers are positive or non-zero, just stupid things like that. It's a very handy. Uh, your positivity is, is is like when you like inequality order gets reversed if you divide by a negative number, and so you're constantly checking that things are positive to to make sure your arguments are fine. Positivity is a very common uh, condition in a lemma, and so to, so to have to, to have the machine generating uh, generating proofs that things are positive automatically is very helpful. So as we work. And try to do mathematics nor as we translate the paper and pencil mathematics uh, into the system, you notice pain points. And for those pain points, what, once you can coherently ask, you know, make a request, then it can be mulled over by the computer scientists and uh, and they can maybe write a tactic uh, that will solve it. So that's one 
area where computer scientists have been absolutely indispensable. I mean, the, uh, the obvious thing I should say before that is just bug bug hunting, right? You, if if my code doesn't, if my code looks to me like it should work, but it doesn't work because it's timing out or taking a long time, I've got no idea why it takes a long time. And you ask a computer scientist, and they take one look at it and go, "Oh, what have you done?" You know, they, look at, they look at you with, "Have you seen? Have you seen the size of these terms?" Do you, and you just like, "I just made the term." You know, there's just lots of ways to make the term. I just made it this way, and they're like, "Well, how about you make it in this way, which is mathematically the same, but but actually, you know, ends up with an object which has finite size." But because I don't have any measure of what's going on internally, right? Right, right. I don't care about I don't care about the types and the terms. I care about the beauty of the mathematics. You know, the type, the types, and the ter- if someone had told me that mathematics is formalized in set theory, I would have just learned how to formalize it in set theory. I'm not I'm not looking at the innards. I don't know how it works. I don't care how it works. I want to do mathematics. So yeah, I I only bother the computer scientists either when either when I get stuck because it doesn't work. You know, this thing should this thing sh- this proof should be fine, but it times out, right? There's a problem. So computer scientists are good at looking at logs and sorting stuff out. You know, this proof right. should be yeah. easy. This proof is two lines on paper, but it's fifty lines in lean. What's happening there? Yeah, you know, that's because you're missing a tactic. And uh, and the other example is I I want to define monoids and groups and rings and fields and normed fields and complete normed fields. And we have this huge, as we've been doing more and more mathematics, we've been finding more and more classes and classes that extend other classes and classes that extend other classes. And we just made this gigantic zoo of mathematical classes that we didn't think twice about because we just use these things all the time. <laughs> you know, obviously, obviously, you know, we have valuations and norms and things like this and, you know, continuous norms and blah, blah, blah. And, um, after a while, the computer scientists were looking at us going, it's huge. Yep. It's just gigantic. Why have, you, why have you made this gigantic? Do you really use all of this stuff? I mean, ab- absolutely. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge problem for them because I've got this complete normed field called K and I need the X plus Y is Y plus X. And that's just obviously true for any complete. But that's not a theory about complete norm. That's not a complete normed field is a normed field and a normed field is a field and a field is a, an abelian group under addition, an abelian group is an abelian monoid. You know, an A plus B equals B plus A. That's the theorem about abelian monoids. So the system has to spot really quickly that a complete normed field is an abelian monoid. But a mathematician just does that instinctively because it's just obvious. You know, we don't, we don't have to explain that A plus B is B plus A in a complete normed field. Because it's whereas the computer scientists are saying that you're you're setting it, this is a huge maze here. <laughs> You've made a gigantic maze and you're expecting us to just navigate it instantaneously. You know, there's some kind of prologue-like search going on here or something. You know, that I and 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 yeah. So there, that was the most extreme reaction to what we were doing. They're the lean developers looked at what lean three, you know, lean three solution to this problem and looked at, you know, the, the, the gigantic, you know, menagerie of classes that we constructed in MathLib and announced that they were going to have to do type class inference in a completely different way. And, and lean four, the algorithm that solves those kinds of questions has been completely rewritten. You know, so the, the you know, the very, you know, the very core of the, of the, the system has been changed. So there's there's been wait, and so that was great because for a while, it was it was kind of interesting. You know, I had this vision that this software was going to change the world, and, and others did too, right? And we were all very motivated to formalizing all of this mathematics. But Leo De Maurer at Microsoft was saying to me, "It's too early. You know, it's the, Lean Three is an experiment, right? Lean Four isn't a finished product." It's just an experiment. Like lean four, lean four is the finished product. Can't you wait? And I was like, we are having, we are having too much fun. Like, n- no way am I waiting. I'm not putting this on hold. We, you know, we're building math, and people are joining the community, and we're doing math in this weird new way that mathematicians have never seen before. Like, no way, we cannot stop now. We have too much momentum. I've seen that you started I, boarding MathLib to lean four. How's that going? Is it, yeah. is it hard? It's fun. I mean, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I I thoroughly enjoy it because it's it's really interesting seeing 
you kind of stepping back now. We've done like we've done like twelve percent, fifteen percent, or something. You know, so we've done like a, a seventh of it or something, uh, and and that's taken a month or two, really. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it will be done by you know by the end of the year. So there's a lot of work, but I, I think as at the minute we're still very much in the basic. We just ported data dot list dot basic. You know, you know three thousand lines of levers about lists. Uh, so how's it going? It's kind of cool. There's a computer. There's a computer program that takes lean three code and outputs lean four code. Oh, that's nice. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so then we've got this lean four code that's supposed to work, and then we've got some errors, and then you go and fix the errors. And I've ported sufficiently many files now that a lot of the errors you kind of think, oh yeah, yeah, yeah I know what right. that problem yeah. is. You know that that problem is just the porting program being dumb, and in fact, there's a PR to fix the porting program. You know, that is because the simplifier is now behaving slightly differently, uh, so we should probably rewrite this argument slightly. And that is because something else changed, and we can work around that. You know, some definition changed that we can't do anything about. If we, we're trying to literally port, we're not making any refactors during the port. So all the definitions in Mathlib, even if we don't like the definition, we port the definition exactly as it is. You know, the refactors are going to. You know, if you want to refactor something, you have to refactor it in Lean 3 and Lean 4 at the same time. So, you know, we're trying to port directly rather than doing refactors at the same time. But occasionally you find definitions. Like I think the definition of integer division is different in Lean 3 and Lean 4. There's lots of ways. You, like, integer division doesn't exist, right? You can't divide an integer by another integer and get an integer. Okay, But unfortunately, you computer scientists seem convinced... <laughs> That it does exist, and you just give the wrong like five divided by two. You're just like it's two. It's like no, it's not. It's not actually two. But but the thing is, well, it is two, right? Or maybe it's three, right? Because maybe you do you round up or do you round down? You have to make some decision. Like when you divide by what's five divided by negative two? Like like I'll, t- I'll tell you, I, I'm a mathematician, right? And I know what five divided by negative two is. It's negative two and a half. Okay, but unfortunately, that's not an integer. So therefore, division by integers shouldn't exist, right? Because we don't need it because it's not a sensible. But it turns out that division by integers is kind of useful in computer science because you want to do division with remainder, right? Yeah. But that's that's not division. But there's lots of there's lots of conventions. Five divided by negative two is it negative two or is it negative three? Like, I don't know. You've, you've got to come up with a convention. <laughs> <laughs> and they changed the convention in lean three and lean four. So, so this caused sort of chaos because then lots of proofs just break because oh the definition gosh. isn't the same. Yeah. So, so that's one of the things we've been running into, but that's not going to happen too often, right? I mean, integer division is only something that you use, you know, in because it because it's not actually because it's as far as I can say, integer division is a pathological function. <laughs> Right, because right, yeah. five divided by two is not two, okay, and, and so you could say it's two if you like. It's like natural subtraction. Like one take away two is not zero, but the, like zero, you what you could say zero is the best approximation, or you could just say let's not define subtraction, you know, it's like, because <laughs> because it's a pathological function yeah. and doesn't have good properties. Yeah, you know, all the lemmas I know about subtraction are not true for this natural subtraction, or many of them are not true. So those. Those are the things that we've run into so far. Uh, and the other big question is, will we be able to get more people involved? And I think that as the mathematics gets more interesting, you know, at the minute we're just about on... We haven't got we haven't ported finiteness yet because the way the way finite sets are defined are uh, a, a multi-set is a list modulo permutations, uh, you know, two, two permutations of it. If you define two permutations of a list to be equal, you know, the list one, two, three, and the list one, three, two are equal. Then the, the, there's the definition of a multi-set. It's list modulo that equivalence relation. And then a, a, a finite set, a fin set, is a multi-set with no duplication. So we've only just ported lists. So multi-sets are next, are actively being worked on. And then we'll have finite sets after that. And then once we've got finite sets, everything is now open up to, you know, We'll be able to do filters and topology, and you know, analysis will start happening. And uh, and I think by the time we're doing, you know, sort of ma- undergraduate level mathematics again, as opposed to stuff which is really foundational, you know, no one no one wants to work on the definition of finiteness, right? That's just an obvious. 
to a mathematician, that's an intuitively obvious thing. Finance doesn't need a definition. You know, I'm sure that I'm sure the set theorists could supply one, but every mathematician <laughs> knows what finiteness means. So once we have finiteness and the API that goes with it, so then we can use it the way that mathematicians use it, then I think more people might be tempted to join in as a port as well. Anybody looking? Anybody wants to learn Lean Four out there and know some mathematics, even if even if they just know some very basic mathematics? Right now, we have a job for you. It's like. You know, learn Lean 4 by porting. Yeah, so we've learned some stuff. But at, at the minute, the, the difference between Lean 3 MathLib and Lean 4 MathLib is that Lean 3 MathLib, Microsoft were looking at us in this weird way. Going like, what is the point? What are you guys doing? What is the point of it all? <laughs> whereas, whereas then we had some big successes. You know, there was like a, a, a Nature article and some, some stuff in Quanta. And then they could see that actually... We were doing, you know, blue sky research, which the math community seemed to be taking an interest in. And so with MathLib4, we've been working hand in hand with Microsoft, uh, with Microsoft Research, I should say. It's, 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 it's Microsoft Research, Liao Damara and his team at Microsoft Research. And so, and so it's sort of quite exciting that you know, the, the core Lean4 development team are very, very open uh, to questions and problems we have about formalizing mathematics because they believe that you know this is one of the many use cases for lean four this is i think their point of view you know they do they do want it to become you know a powerful tool doing the things that isabel and cock and other programs like that are doing but they also want to you know support research mathematics so it's been rather wonderful working with them nice so lean four is going to be more stable now so it's still it's still on nightly it's, Okay. They're still re- they're still releasing nightly releases, but um, they 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 very much in tune with the porting process, which is good. You know, they're, they're listening to us and we're listening to them, uh, and and they're solving problems that we're running into, which is great. Uh, whereas in yeah in 2017, it's about things weren't so smooth. I think, but by, by 2017, Microsoft Research were already interested in Lean Four. And then, you know, the math lib people were coming along saying, oh, there's all these things you could change that would make it more convenient to do mathematics. And I think their attitude at the time is, I mean, that might be true, but we're working on something bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so after a while, the, 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 the mathematical community forked uh, Lean 4, the Lean 3, sorry. They, right. they forked Lean 3. And so we had our own community version that's now on. Microsoft worked on it up to Lean 3.4.1. And now we're on like 3.50 point something. You know? oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's had many, many releases since then. Oh. Uh, but, but Lean 4 is, is very short of stable releases. I think it's had one uh, very preliminary. And it's changed a huge amount since then. Uh, so I think maybe they're, they're very happy to still keep changing it because they're still trying to work out. You know, they, MathLib is somehow their flagship project. MathLib is Lean's flagship project right now. They're obviously... Many other projects exist, but this is a, you know this is a million lines of code that does some highly non-trivial stuff, and uh, so that's their flagship project. And uh, I think they they want to make sure that Core Lean, you know, works. Core Lean Four is still capable of supporting a gigantic mathematics library. If someone here is that is listening to us wants to work on MathLib, what should he do? If if they like the terrible answer right now is just wait, wait for six months, wait until the port is over. Because right now, <laughs> right now, the situation is really quite chaotic because we have MathLib 3, this repository with 500 PRs. Whoa. Right? And, and 500 open PRs and, 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 you know, more arriving all the time. And then there's this sort of tension between should you be merging MathLib 3 PRs and making MathLib 3 even bigger? And thus making it harder to port, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so if if you're interested in the kind of mathematics uh, which has already been ported to Lean Four, then great. You know, start on Lean Four. But the problem is st- the problem with getting a mathematician to start on Lean Four is there's no documentation, right? Because all the yeah. documentation is written for Lean Three. So right now, my advice to somebody that's interested in in learning Lean and doing mathematics is. Don't attempt to contribute to MathLib, right? Or because start port- is, help porting. Yeah, I, I, yeah. If you know, if you know the language already, then then sure, help porting. 
But if you're not interested in doing the port and you just want to learn how, see how lean works, then just make a project, make an independent project of your own that's that's built, you know, that has MATLAB as a dependency. Read through the, the literature there is, mathematics in lean, and then take an area of math, mathematics you're interested in. Who cares if it's been done before, right? But just make a project to make that area and, and you know, learn, you know, learn what it's like to use a theorem prover. That's what I would recommend People do. It's difficult to contribute to MathLib right now, uh, unless you're somehow already part of the. I don't know. It's difficult. It's difficult for mathematicians to contribute to the MathLib project right now. It's difficult, but not impossible. And the reason is that there's a lot going on because we're in the. I mean, this must have been when Python two changed to Python three. Yeah. There must have been an equally sort of chaotic, you know, a, a, a chaotic time. Uh, and then after a while, you know, the, the foundations will have settled down. Lots and lots of code will have been available for Python 3. And then people can start writing projects in Python 3 because, you know, many people have updated their libraries to Python 3. I think that's one of the things that I, I think it's kind of, well, maybe you will disagree with this because you use it a lot. But for me, one of the things why Lean is so exciting to me is because it's really new. It's easy to change a lot of things and not break that much, like, they pretty much broke MathLib, right? <laughs> but if you if you if you do a major change like that in Coq, oh my God, things would be would be a lot more chaotic. For example, right? So yeah, I see. Yeah, that's interesting. That's yeah. Lean four is still being developed. I mean, I would. I, it might have had a relate like four point zero point zero might exist and be a thing, but nobody uses that, right? Because somehow. All, we're all many of the projects use much more recent nightlies, and and yeah, it's 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 right now. It's that you really can break stuff. It, it is exciting, and and the developers are listening to us. Yeah, you know, when we say actually, it would be good if this stuff broke. Can you break it for us? <laughs> you know, oftentimes they will say, yeah, sure. You know, I can see your point of view. Let's let's slightly reach. Let's slightly change things and break a bunch of stuff because we just. The, the idea, right now, I think MathLib 4 should be regarded as the test, even if you're not interested in mathematics, right? MathLib 4 is just a test, right? You know, a, an interactive theorem prover is a hugely complicated, a hugely complicated piece of software. It's especially lean because you could, you could switch between term mode and tactic mode, and you have to have a very robust framework for writing tactics, and yet, you know, and then some other framework for you know elaboration and writing terms. And uh, MathLib 4 is the test case, right? Can can we get a million lines of mathematics, including some very complex mathematics? Could we get that working in Lean 4? And if we can, then that's every indication that Lean 4 is 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 you know is actually is fit for purpose. And right now, is it fit for purpose? It's an open problem, right? Because the purpose isn't there. You know, we haven't got a million lines of code yet. Right? We've got under a hundred thousand lines of code. But we have got over 50,000 lines of code. So at least it can definitely support a 50,000 line long project. But can it support a 1 million line long project? Like, ask me again in a year, and I'll tell you. But by then, there will have been many, many new PRs to call in for. <laughs> right? And, and yeah. by that point, then it might be getting difficult for, you know, then, then changes you know, might be harder to come by. Leo was always very reluctant to make changes. He said, every change comes with a cost, right? You have to test it and you have to figure out, is this definitely, you know, the, the, the person that's suggesting the change, they know that change is better for them, but is it definitely better for everyone? You see, that's somehow, that's somehow a hard question. So it's, but fortunately, everyone is a small number of people right now in Lean 3, in, in Lean 4, so... We, we can safely answer those questions. But yeah, we, we shall see. It's an, it's an exciting time. But it's right now, it's difficult to contribute to MathLib because in my mind, the only thing we want in MathLib, the only thing we want to do right now in MathLib is just get the whole thing working in Lean 4. So if you're interested in mathematics, that's great. If you're interested in doing mathematics in Lean, there's lots and lots of things you could do. You, know, you could go through the mathematics in Lean tutorial, Learn how to use Lean three. Start experimenting. Make you know, prove your own theorems. Make your own projects. But if you want to contribute to MathLib, then really I would say, you know, help with the port or wait a year. <laughs> help with the port or wait till the port's done. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great advice. Now, um, I, I also saw in your in, in your blog posts 
that you have played around a little bit with Open G GTP. What are your thoughts for Lean in, the, in this case? It, it seems to me that these language models do two things, right? F firstly, they generate natural language proofs of natural language mathematics. And there, the problem I see is that they can very confidently state complete nonsense. But this is one of the things that, <laughs> yeah, this is the, 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 like chat GPT will, it will very yeah. confidently write some stuff that either it's read on the internet, which is not the most reliable source, uh, or it somehow worked out, you know, or, you know, it might be true, but it will confidently say it is true. Yep. So this is great when you're, you know, when you're writing poetry and absolute truth isn't, you know, the, you know, or you're writing, in, you know, when you're writing something where things can be a little bit wrong and it's not the end of the world, uh, then that's great. But the thing about mathematics is that everything has to be exactly right. So these language models that are confidently stating incorrect mathematics, for me, are, are, are no help whatsoever. They're, they're a step. They're not a step in the right direction. They're not a step in the wrong direction. They're just a new thing. It's a noise. But, in the, it, in some, it's, it's, yeah. but a lot of it is noise, yeah. yeah. When you actually try to get them to do any kind of remotely non-trivial mathematics, they complete. They become completely unreliable yep. because they're yeah. not spouting facts. They're, they're spouting sentences that make syntactic sense that they're claiming are facts, uh, but, but which just might be rubbish. So using natural language, uh, th these tools which are generating natural language paragraphs of mathematics, I right now I can't see a use for them in, in sort of you know, research level mathematics. But what about the tools which are generating computer language, right? The, like there's tools that generate lean code, like Meta and OpenAI have both solved math Olympiad problems by you know auto generating lean code wow. that then compiles, right? Wow. And if and it, and if it compiles, then 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 we know it's it's we know it was true, right? Yeah, if you read this statement and you can agree with this statement that it matches it, it, what you exactly. want, right? Yeah. If, if you agree with the statement and then Lean accepts the proof or Isabel, whatever these people are using. So for me, uh, the, the systems which are generating proofs, for, fully formal proofs, for me, they're much more exciting because they are not going to fall into this trap of confidently asserting stuff that just doesn't actually make sense when you dig down and try and understand what's going on. You see this in papers, right? Humans write math papers and you read stuff you don't understand. But then you have to work very hard and try and figure out why this thing is true. And if somebody I trust writes something I don't understand, then I'm very happy to do that work. But if an AI writes something I don't understand, then my instant reaction is maybe this is just nonsense. You know, so that's why I worry about with the AI. That's why I worry about with the AIs, and what I worry about with the fully formalized stuff is that they're generating fully formalized proofs, but of very very simple statements, and that's because maybe they're just training on one million lines of Mathlib, and then they could you know they could do basic first year undergrad mathematics maybe, but the researchers aren't going to get excited about that. So, you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna get computers to prove the Riemann hypothesis? Well, I'm sure we could ask Chat GPT to prove the Riemann hypothesis. And it could just generate a bunch of stuff, and some of it just won't be true. Or or we could ask Lean to generate a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. We, we could we could ask an AI that can write lean code, not human language. And there the problem is it just won't be able to do it, because it can't do stuff that's one thousand times simpler. So that's where I that's where I see Uh, AI and mathematics right now, uh, it's yeah the, the the language stuff is well, like, yeah that that's where I see it right now. Yeah, it's going. It's, I think it's really exciting when you get to we get. I think we're starting to get to a point where we can we can feed a maybe maybe we can feed a a PDF a, a LaTeX paper in math and it will be able to automatically generate the link code for us. That would, that, be, would be, that would be the game changer. Yeah. Once, once we have that, then in some sense, you know, what is the Xena project is trying to get mathematicians to learn how to write code in Lean. In some sense, that puts the Xena project out of business. <laughs> Because <laughs> like, we don't need the undergraduates to learn it. We yep. just feed in the textbooks. Yep. But the question is, when is that actually going to be workable? 
right? And believe me, there's no there's no shortage of data, right? You have the archive archive.org. It's just like I I subscribe to the daily archive. Now every day I get an email that says here's twenty new papers in number theory, <laughs> yeah. like twenty. Yeah. Okay, so so there's your gigantic database if you want training, uh, but. The, the question is, can you reliably translate it into lean? And the problem is, is it's very difficult because mathematicians leave stuff out. And they, by the time you've got to a certain level of maturity, you know, a serious research mathematician writing a technical paper, they're going to leave loads of stuff out. And right now, I don't think the computers can fill in those holes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so th- this would be a huge... Yeah, this would be a this would be a huge step forward, and it's something that I know the AI community are taking very seriously, but I haven't seen, you know, hugely positive results, you know, when it comes to modern research. And, and let let me say that it's it's the fact that we in the lean community are engaging with modern research mathematics, the kind of mathematics, you know, which is winning modern fields medals. That's what's made the mathematical community interested in what we're doing. It's the fact that we're targeting hard mathematics. And I think if you want AI to cause a stir in the math community, you're going to have to get AI targeting modern research math. And at the minute, it's doing toy stuff. It's doing high school stuff or math Olympiad stuff. And math Olympiad questions are hard, but they're, um, they are not what, can, you know, what researchers are thinking about, right? You know, they're, they're difficult questions about elementary objects. Math researchers are often considering highly complex objects, you know, like perfectoid spaces that you mentioned earlier. You know, this is this was this was one of the first things that got that got the math community interested in lean. Was that I went round saying I formalized a bunch of algebraic geometry with a bunch of first year undergraduates. You know, we formalized the definition of a scheme, and all the algebraic geometers in my department just didn't care at all. They were just like, I knew what a scheme was when I was a PhD student. Like, that's not a big deal. <laughs> You know, but then when we did perfectoids, then we so then we formalized the definition of a perfectoid space, and it was just the same principle, but the only difference was that schemes were invented in 1960 by Grothendieck are in a completely standard part of an MSc or PhD syllabus, uh, whereas perfectoid spaces were invented in you know the mid 2000 to 2015 or 2013 or something. Is it too hard to explain Shotson. to to explain what a perfectoid space is? Or? It's just a definite it's just a set with some structure satisfying some axioms okay. do you want to know what do you want to know do you want to know the definition or you want to know the point <laughs> well how hard is the definition <clears throat> it's just eighteen thousand lines of lean code oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay okay i don't think i'm gonna get that in like a couple of minutes <laughs> but that's not but i don't my picture of a perfectoid space as a researcher my picture of a perfectoid space is not the definitions Right, you do, you don't think of a group as something that satisfies the definitions of a group. You think of a group as being the symmetries of an object. Right? And similarly, my I have a picture of a perfectoid space that uh, that doesn't involve any of the axioms, uh, but it's you know it, it's it's quite a technical it's quite a technical picture. But I have some kind of picture. You know, it's a you you there's objects that you're interested in, sort of finitely generated geometric objects, finite dimensional geometric objects. And you're interested in studying maps between them. And sometimes you can have nice objects, but maps between them can be complicated and not nice. Like the squaring function, that maps the complexes to the complexes. And 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 for most points of the complexes, that's kind of a nice function. But at zero, there's something weird going on. At zero, things are getting wrapped up. Like the square of zero is zero, but somehow it's... it's so if you take a little... The square of one is one, but you can have a little disk near one and the square of everything in that little disk maps to a little disk. Uh, yeah, the square of a number that's near one is a number that's near one. And you can write down a little disk near the first one, a little disk near the second one. And the squaring function is just a bijection, just matches those up, those two little disks, just identifies them. Whereas near zero, you can't do that because somehow you have you have two things, two very small, x and negative, if x is very, very small, x and negative x get squared to the same thing. So there's always two things going to one thing. It's not a nice one-to-one matching near near zero. The squaring function is kind of irritating. It's a ramified map. So we're interested in kind of stuff 
we're interested in stuff. We don't like ramified maps. They're a bit complicated. And traditionally, you, you might want to avoid them and just prove theorems about unramified maps and things like this. And the whole perfectoid space thing goes completely the opposite direction. It says, first of all, let's start by making some cover of your object, which is so high, highly ramified at every single point that it's just some completely infinite, the not finite in any way, horrible mess. But once you've made that big extension to this vastly somewhat super, super wrapped up, infinitely twisted everywhere object, these objects here, all the maps between them are nice because all the horrible stuff happened already. <laughs> okay. Everything right. that was horrible, everything horrible that could have happened already happened. So by the time you're in the perfectoid world, all the maps between these things are somehow very reasonably behaved. They're almost unramified or something like this. So... So it was a quite a weird way of solving a geometric problem. That's 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 some of the 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 the, the way that's the picture that mathematicians might carry around, or or they might carry around. Yeah, that's the picture I carry around of the perfectoid space, and other people carry different pictures. But at the end of the day, it's it's just a set or a type. To you guys, it's probably a type. I mean, in lead, it's a type. <laughs> <laughs> but in, if you read the definition in the papers of Schultz, it's a set together with some structure and satisfying some axioms. Yeah. That's all. It's an inductive type, but with only one constructor. <laughs> one very long constructor, but only one constructor. So no need to ever do induction on it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that proves your point. No need to do induction. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, who needs induction? Uh, well, that's, that's Induction the... on the naturals. That, <laughs> you, you, induction on the naturals you need, but, but honestly... Uh, that's funny. Well, um, I think I think we covered pretty much everything we we were said to. Well, here's a bonus question: If you could go back when you started learning Lean and going through this Zena project and teaching students, if you could go back in time and and do something different, would you have done anything different with the knowledge you have now? In terms of the research I produced, I, the, the, the one thing I regret is that I entered the area in an extremely inelegant way. <laughs> How come? Because I was just, I, for a start, I was horrified by what, is, what was going on in the other communities uh, because, because nobody, had, nobody was formalizing the mathematics that I knew and liked. Right? That was the thing. No, nobody was, nobody was taking... Nobody was taking mathematics. Nobody in the maths community was taking theorem provers seriously, and nobody in the theorem prover community was taking maths seriously in in some sense, in, in the sense that they weren't formalizing the Langlands program or perfectoid spaces or you know, modern stuff that wins Fields medals, right? No, nobody was doing that, and then. I started doing that by myself and realized that there was no reason not to do it. There was no obstruction. It was just nobody was doing it. And then I somehow said some very rude things to, <laughs> to various senior members of these communities in an attempt to either convince them. To, 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 I, yeah, I landed with a large bump, basically saying, what are you guys doing and why aren't you doing what I think you should be doing? And I expressed that in a very naive way. Uh, and I think probably made some enemies. And so maybe if I was changing anything, I might have been more politically sensible. But on the other hand, I think the fact that I just made a huge amount of noise yeah, yeah. probably might have sort of raised the profile of my agenda. Yeah. And so maybe I wouldn't even change that. <laughs> I, I'm constantly apologizing to the people in the other communities for the dumb things I said. And the the univ it still goes with the univalent community. It still goes on. I'm, I'm annoying people in the univalent community without just by accident all the time. And it, it, so it's somehow it, so uh, annoying people in other communities seems to be something that's inbuilt, and it's just one of the one of the things that comes with uh, c comes with being me. Uh, because I don't really think before I speak. Uh, I, I, I've got the vision, right? The vision yeah. is we're going to get we're going to a huge amount. Let's 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 formalize an entire master's degree, okay, in in one place, 
And then let's just use it to make spectacular projects about modern research mathematics. And But I, what I find difficult is that not everybody believes the same thing as me. <laughs> <laughs> So what's what's the thing about about the thing with the univalent people? You don't you don't believe that you 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 should be constructive? No, yeah, yeah, construct, yeah, absolutely. Constructivism is a cancer in my in my view. Con, <laughs> con, 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 this this is the ridiculous thing. So I was told a story, right? As right. a as a mathematician, mm -hmm. I was told a story as an undergraduate research PhD student postdoc stuff, right? I went through I went through the training. And throughout that training, I was told a story. And the story I was told was the following story. When people started writing down the foundations of mathematics, they realized that there was an issue and that sometimes the things we did were non-computable. And Hilbert said that non-computability was fine, was you know, a perfectly reasonable mathematical you know, approach. And then there were some other people, like maybe this guy Brower, that said, no, I think we should be constructivists and just do constructive mathematics and non-constructive stuff is sort of less interesting or something. I don't, I don't know what he said. I've got no idea what he said because the point, the point is Hilbert won, right? This is what we're told in mathematics departments. Hilbert won. The law of the excluded middle is an axiom of mathematics. The axiom of choice is an axiom of mathematics. And the constructivists just died out. <laughs> And, and that was true. And that was true for many decades. Con constructivism in pure mathematics just did not exist. And then computer science was born. And then it turns out that constructivism is super important in computer science. And now there's this weird new generation of computers, computer, you know, it's constructivist 2.0. Yep. They, they've come out of the woodwork and they're doing, construct, they're doing mathematics constructively because for them it's super important that a proof is a program. This lie that you tell, <laughs> that you tell people that a proof is a pro a proof is not remotely a program because proofs can be non-constructive. So this beautiful, this beautiful duality you have, or whatever you want to call it, a proof and a program are the same thing. You know, this is this is regarded as a very beautiful, you know, it's a very beautiful observation in the world of computer science. But in mathematics, it's simply not true because our our concept of what a proof is is far more liberal. And there are many, many proofs that aren't programs, but it doesn't matter because we're mathematicians. Who cares about programs? Right? <laughs> right. We're, not, we're not writing programs. We're proving theorems. Right? And, and the fact that we end up proving we end up proving that there exists some number n with some property, that's regarded as a cool theorem. And we've got no idea what n is or how to compute n. Like n is completely non computable but that we don't care because we prove that n exists. And so we, you know you get points for that. You know, and then maybe some people later could do the boring work of actually trying to figure out what n is. <laughs> you know, the, fact, the fact that you prove that n exists, that's the breakthrough. Yeah, you know, we don't care about the program part. And and so, and so, it was a big shock to me when I entered the community to find that constructivists still existed, and I had absolutely no time for what they were doing for, for many years, <laughs> no time whatsoever, because it was just not relevant. You can't do the kind of mathematics I do constructively. Like it's it's literally, you know. There's two problems. The first problem, the first problem is that I have one definition, and constructively it turns out there's five definitions, and they're all constructively distinct. And so you don't know what you're proving theorems about. And then secondly, some of the, you know, some of the some of the proofs just don't work constructively. They can't be done. So we've got too many objects and not enough theorems. And it's just like maths is hard enough already. Like, why make it harder by deleting some axioms? <laughs> because for me, this is a, the law of the excluded middle is an axiom of mathematics, right? I was absolutely, the, the axiom of choice is an axiom of mathematics. This is what I was taught. And then to discover that there are still people alive that, that, that don't believe this was a real shock to me. And it, in some sense, it's still a shock. But the thing is, the univalent people have got their own research agenda. They, because, because they're not using the regular maths rules they're using. I mean, they, they, that's the kind of, I've upset them again, right? They're, they're not doing what I would call regular math and they would call just one kind of math. But it's the kind of math that 99% of people in math departments are doing. They're not doing regular math or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're, they're doing maths in this weird new way and their types are complicated. And so they, they have lots and lots of hard problems that we just don't even see. 
in sort of regular math, in what I call regular math world and what the univalent people will call something else. They, so it's sort of, I, I do find it difficult to get on board with what they're doing. I'm, I'm still very much struggling to accept constructivism because I just don't ever see it in my day job. Right. It's, 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 it's not a thing. The thing, the, how I look at it is that a lot of what you do is to reason about about things that computer scientists are, are interested in. The sort of it's not even math in a way, right? Like it's a, it's this structure that needs a lot of other structures. So, well, I don't know. For example, if you want to reason about when two functions in computer science are 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 the same, there are many yeah. different ways to reason about that, right? Yeah, there's, there's only one way. <laughs> there's only one way that two functions can be the same. Yeah, in mathematics. yeah, and it's yeah. If they give the, the same extension out. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Extension analysis is another axiom. Yeah. You see. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all sorting algorithms are the same because <laughs> <laughs> they just take a list and output the list, but sorted. That's there so you good. Go. <laughs> so I can I can prove that they're all equal. You see, so this is really. Yeah. But you see, that's a yeah. really basic thing, right? Is. What is a function? You know, when are two functions equal? Yeah. Right? If people have got different opinions on that question, mm -hmm. then you can kind of see that you know that 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 really that's two that's two different theories. Yeah, yeah. And in mathematics, there's only one answer to this question, right? Two functions right. are the same if they evaluate. You know, they give the same output <laughs> on all inputs. That's mm. the, that's that's an axiom or a theorem or whatever. Again, that was something I was taught on day one <laughs> yeah. in the maths department. Yeah. And there's no going back. Right. There's, right. There's no good. So I meet people that have already been indoctrinated, you know, and, and there I show them lean. And and with the, many of the other theorem provers, there's a large percentage of people working in those areas that place much higher value on the concept of constructiveness, and things like this. And this is one of the things I tried to do very early on in lean was just tell people there's, there's nothing about constructive maths there. It's just regular maths. If we can just do normal maths, of course you can assume the law of the excluded middle. Of course you can assume the extensionality of everything. You know, of course you can assume the axiom of choice. It's all there. You know, and, and all the people that are fussing about constructivism, just you know, just let them let them fuss, but we're not gonna fuss. <laughs> that's that's a great that yeah, that's a great way to put it. I like it. Well, with that, I think it was a, a great way to to end this conversation. Um, but is there anything else you think we didn't talk particularly and you'd like to to go back to or or mention no i sh i should just apologize to all the people that i've inevitably <laughs> upset through, through my my blinkered ignorance about what mathematics is you know because my views of it are not the same as many of the people in the community well in But a sense I'm, they're just inspired by what i've been taught as a mathematician in a sense that's one of the reasons why i invited you as well i wanted a mathematician point of view Okay. Well, anyway, ap apologies to the people I upset, but there you you know, I don't have any more. I don't have any more things to say. <laughs> well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming here. This was such a delightful conversation. Yeah. yeah thanks for having me on. <laughs> it's, it's been a treat. So that was it for today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Kevin is just such a funny guy. I, I, I just had so much fun talking to him. Thank you so much for coming again, Kevin. And if you guys have any questions for me or for him, make sure to send them on our website, typetheoryforall.com. You will see a comment sessions once you click in the episode there, and I'll make sure to forward them to Kevin or to try my best to answer myself. You can do that for any of the episodes that are there. If you are a more shy person and you wanna keep yourself anonymous or you don't want to leave your name in the website or things like that, you can send us an email, typetheoryforall at gmail.com. You may also follow us on Twitter at ttforall. Make sure to follow us on Twitter. It, would, it helps us a lot. Don't forget that we also have a donation platform and you will help us immensely if you could show us some support and I don't know, pay me a coffee. It's like, what, five bucks? Come on, you have five bucks. 
And I think that's it. I hope you guys are having an amazing new year. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.